The anime begins with Tokumamori, who is a pathetic, disgusting loser for not eating his meal. He pleads and apologizes repeatedly, but his mother pays him no attention and leads him to the mercy of his stepfather's feet, he suddenly wakes up on a bus, as Sogo Ayaka the class president tells Shogo Oyamana to give back her novel. He makes fun of her reading preferences, surprised that she's actually into romance novels despite leading people to believe otherwise. She asks him if there's a problem with her choices and he belittles her, saying he could never read something like that because his brain cells will evaporate. While the scuffle is going on, Takao Hijiri notices that Takao Itsuki, her younger sister, is lost in the mountain scenery outside, but she tells her to pay more attention to what's happening on the bus. Ayaka tells Oyamana to give back her novel, since he isn't interested in it, but he's reluctant to grant her wish. He asks for her social media handle and return for the novel, but she declined his request. The bus was taking the class on their field trip, and while the banter between the president and Oyamata was going on, Toka considered stepping in. Still he realized he would be too insignificant to do anything effective. He decides to remain indifferent, just like the Takao sisters and their class teacher, Ayaka asks Oyamata to give back her novel once again, but he insists that she must share her social media handle with him before she can get back her novel. Ayaka remains persistent when Toka suddenly gets up, telling Oyamata to give back her novel. While Oyamata was surprised that Toka stood up for Ayaka, Toka was even more surprised to see himself standing because he didn't know when his body moved on impulse. Oyamata recognizes him, but wonders what gave him the guts to tell him what to do. Toka tries to reason with Oyamata telling him to give back Ayaka's novel because she's getting annoyed by his mischief. Oyamata laughs off the Toka's show of chivalry, and he wonders where he suddenly got the confidence from. Takuto Kurihara, one of the class elites tells Oyamata to return Ayaka's novel, but Oyamata for some support in putting Toka in his place, Takuto tells him he has no interest in such frivolities and Oyamata is jealous of Takuto's cool aura, Takuto tells him he can ignore Toka, but he must give back Ayaka's novel because it doesn't sit right with him, a sage Isenjo commends Takuto for stepping up for Ayaka, as Oyamata hands over the novel to her. Other students silently commend Takuto for being so nice despite being an elite student, Oyamata takes his seat behind Yasu Tomohiro and he begins kicking his chair from behind, questioning him about what gave Toka the audacity to stand up to him. Yasu quivers in fear, apologizing for his earlier actions, but the teacher cuts in, telling him to quit bothering Yasu. Toka was also surprised that he had the confidence to stand up to Oyamata, and he concluded that his dream was the cause because it put him on edge, while Oyamata complains about his grand moment being ruined by Toka. The goddess chants an incantation which suddenly teleports all the students to a hall. They wonder if they're in some kind of dream, as they all suddenly appear in an unknown location. Goddess Viseus addresses them, welcoming them as heroes to alien her kingdom. She informs them that heroes are summoned to fight the great demon emperor any time he appears. The demon emperor was once defeated 200 years ago by the combined efforts of heroes, but he was recently resurrected again, prompting the need for the summoning of new heroes. The goddess begs the new heroes from other worlds for their strength to take down such a big threat to her kingdom's prosperity, the students still have a hard time wrapping their heads around what the goddess is trying to say. Their teacher suddenly calms them down, reassuring them that everything will be alright since he's with them, though he doesn't fully understand their present predicament, he tells them they need to pay attention to whatever the goddess says for clarity. The goddess thanks him for that and he smiles sheepishly, trying to get into her good books. Toka looks around, Noting the stone walls, the old-fashioned bonfires, the armored soldiers, and the features of the goddess, despite all he could see, he still wasn't convinced that they were in another world. Takuto wonders what will happen if they refuse to cooperate and she tells them that they're stuck there regardless because she can't take them back to their world. Takuto asks her if there's a way back and she tells them that it can only be done through the reverse summoning event, which requires a special magic element called the evil element. This element can only be obtained from the heart of the great demon emperor or the absorbance of the elements released when the emperor perishes into a special necklace. Oyamata is pissed wondering what the demon emperor has to do with them because they're from another. The goddess gets on her knees, begging them to act as heroes and become the messiah of everyone in her kingdom. Ayaka explains to the goddess that they can't be as much help even if she considers them their messiah, because they're just humans. The goddess tells them they have power as no other humans have and Toka suddenly feels a strange tingling sensation. She explains that the powers were bestowed upon them as she summoned them to her world, but Oyamana doesn't believe her, and he tells her to stop playing pranks on them. 
The goddess orders her guard to release a demon wolf on a prisoner, which it wastes no time devouring. She then takes out the wolf using a fireball spell, which surprises everyone. The students are now convinced that they're in an entirely different world than the one they're used to. The goddess asks them to approach a crystal ball individually so their skills can be revealed to them. Each student approaches the ball and their magic powers are appraised, but when Oyamana approaches the ball and places his hand on it, it gives off a bright red color, which surprises the mages. Oyamana is so impressed with his skills shown off by the crystal that he decides to accept his inevitable role as the messiah of the new world. Takuda walks up to the crystal ball to measure his magic abilities, but the crystal ball gets so overloaded that it breaks, the goddess praises him for being an S-rank hero and Oyamana runs over to her, wondering what rank he's in, she informs him that he is an A-rank hero, and he's disappointed that he couldn't outclass Takuto. Ayaka steps up to test her magic skills, and she also breaks the crystal ball, earning the S-rank, Hijiri follows suit, breaking the crystal and also earning the S-rank qualification. The goddess is amazed at the luck she had in just one summoning ritual, because getting an S-rank hero is very rare, but she managed to get three at once. Toka steps up to test his abilities, but the crystal ball only gives off a dull purple color, which makes the goddess conclude that he's insignificant, she ignores him and calls up the next person to detect their magic ability and Toka walks away dejectedly because he's still treated like a background character, even in a different world. He decides to accept that as his reality because he won't be getting any special treatment. Yasu steps up to measure his magic, and the goddess is impressed because he's giving off the same aura as the dark hero, who is one of the strongest heroes in the past. The goddess shows the heroes how to check their stats and Toka decides to look at his stats. He's disappointed in how average his stats are, but he notices that he has the inherent skill of abnormal state endowment. The goddess explains that the inherent skill is unique to each individual, but Oyamana is fed up with her yapping and he tells her to quit explaining. His teacher tries to put him in order but Oyamana tells the teacher he has no right to talk to an A rank like that because he's just a D rank hero. The goddess informs them that they're about to perform an important ritual and she calls Toka up, but he's not enthusiastic about it. The guards force him forward as the goddess explains that the lowest ranks in the past have a way of hindering the higher ranking heroes. This heroes decided that such heroes should be disposed of, and since Toka was the lowest in that group, that was his fate. The goddess doesn't want to dispose of Toka in front of his classmates so she decides to give him a chance to redeem himself. She tells him that he'll be sent to some ruins using the magic circle, and that if he manages to back up he will be given the free will to live peacefully in Alien. Toka wondered if he was being sent to a dangerous place, and the goddess tells him the place is very dangerous because criminals and corrupted heroes have been sent to the ruins in the past. He decides to tell her about his inherent skill, which is the abnormal state endowment skill, hoping it will help him out of his predicament. She informs him that all abnormal state skills and spells have no value in Alien because their effects and duration are too weak and short, she informs him that his unique skill is a disappointment because he can't even use it to take down low-level demons. Toka is dejected by this but the goddess piles on the insults, telling him it would be a waste of time to level up because his stats are too low to ever become significantly high. Toka couldn't understand why he was being subjected to such a horrible fate when everything was done against his will, and he tried to protest against the goddess but Takuto cut him off, Takuto tells him to accept his fate and get going so he doesn't keep everyone else waiting, Yasu goes over to Toka and extends out a helping hand. Toka remembers all they've been through in the past, and he's glad that Yasu is on his side, but Yasu tells him to address him with more respect because he's a higher rank hero, he walks away as the goddess announces the commencement of the ritual, the circle begins to glow and the goddess throws down a leather pocket, telling Toka that the pocket is his unique item. She tells him the orb on the pocket blows when infused with mana which is all the pocket does. Ayaka suddenly protests the goddess's decision to send Toka to the ruins because he's their classmate, the goddess knocks her out while she tells everyone else to witness the fate of the only loser in their group, Toka is pissed by this and he decides to attack the goddess with a paralyzed spell, but it's dispelled by her magic bubble, which protects her against abnormal state spells. Toka's classmates make fun of him for being so powerless and he's so pissed off that they have such low impression of him, the Takao sisters walk away because they can't stand the humiliation that Toka is being put through, Toka had enough of the goddess and his classmates looking down on him, he channels that frustration and tells the goddess to be ready for his revenge if he ever makes it back alive. 
As the ritual is completed and he disappears, he tries to check his stats but the window refuses to come up because of lack of visibility, he locates his pocket in the darkness and he pours mana into it, making it, he begins to make his way across the ruins when he stumbles upon some skeletal remains, Toka is now scared of the monsters that could be residing in the ruins. He suddenly dodges as a minotaur monster attacks him from behind. Toka decides to run away from the monster as fast as possible, trusting his instincts to lead him through because he can feel the murderous intent of the monsters, Toka suddenly trips on a stone and falls to the ground, surrendering to his fate as a meal for the monster. He then remembers how his classmates look down on him, and he realizes that he wants power so he can teach them all a lesson, he uses his paralyzed skill on the monster but he's surprised it worked, he decides to keep running, wondering why his spell worked, when the goddess said it would be useless against low-level demons. Toka sums up his encounter as a miracle but he comes up on a bird demon and he could feel its intent to take him down, he uses his paralyzed skill again and he's surprised that it worked, he reasons that his abnormal state skills are different from the other state skills known in Alien, he realizes that he doesn't have much mana left so he uses his poison skill on the demon bird. He's worried about what will happen if he keeps using his skills and drains his mana completely, he decides to rest for a minute but the Minotaur appears again because his paralyzed skill has worn off. Toka wonders if someone will come to his rescue but he remembers that no one ever comes to his aid, he decides to keep laying waste to the monsters so that he can stay alive for as long as possible, he's ready to begin the struggle for survival in the ruins as he makes up his mind to live. The story continues, we see Toka attempts to use Paralyze on the Minotaur again but this time the skill fails to activate, so Toka has to jump out of the way, he's informed by the system that he is not allowed to cast the same effect multiple times on a single target, so it becomes up with a new plan and casts sleep on the Minotaur, causing it to fall to the ground unconscious. And once the monster is out cold, Toka applies poison to it as well, it looks like there are no restrictions on stacking effects, but he's out of mana so if he keeps using his skills, he will eventually burn through his stamina as well, and are still a lot more monsters for him to deal with. Toka begins spamming paralysis and eventually he has managed to stop all the monsters, but has left him on the verge of collapse. However, his troubles aren't over yet, as even more monsters begin to approach, so he has no choice but to keep using paralyzed until his body can't take it anymore, and it's not long before he reaches his limit and can't go on. There are still a lot of monsters around him, but he knows if he tries to use his still even one more time it could mean the end of him, he has no other options available but luckily, just he's about to use up the last of his body stamina, the cockatrice that he pours in a while ago suddenly eyes and due to this memory's level shoots up until he's at level 258 and both his mana and stamina are replenished. Toka doesn't understand what happened at first, but then he notices the dead monster and realizes that he must have gotten experience because his poison killed that one, and with his energy replenished he can keep fighting as much as necessary. As he continues to spam paralysis his skill levels up, leading him to believe he can upgrade it by repeated use, but he will worry about that later since for now, he has to make sure he can escape this place alive. With his paralysis now being level 2 Toka notices that he now has the option to select multiple targets at once, so he does so and the monsters are all immediately frozen in place. So far, the status effects of have 100% success rate so Vicious is probably the only person in this world that his skill has no effect on, he begins inflicting poison on all the paralyzed monsters and eventually his poison skill levels up as well, but there are still a lot more monsters here, so that means he can level up even more. Toka takes a look at his status window and since he leveled up, his stats are far higher than they were when he first got here, especially his mana which is now over 8000 in mana is his only way of surviving this hell hole. Toka takes a break and sits down while he waits for the poison to do its thing, and eventually the monsters begin dying one by one, raising memory's level even further. By the time he's level 500, Toka is fairly confident that he can now make it out of the ruins, so be prepared to take care of the remaining monsters. However, after seeing Toka kill dozens of them with ease, the monsters have enough common sense to know that they shouldn't mess with him, so they all run off. Now that the area is safe, Toka sifts through the piles of rotting bones in order to find any loop that he could use, and after getting his hands on a cloak and a blade, he sets off to escape the ruins as he looks for the exit, he comes across many different monsters, but he has realized that he faces another problem. He has no food, so he's going to start soon if he doesn't get something to eat, he's so desperate that he's even willing to eat monster meat, so after retracing his steps, 
he returns to the monster corpses and reluctantly begins carving into them to eat what he can. However, as the eyeball pops out and Toka tries to eat it, he realizes that the monster's entire body has acid in it, so he won't be able to eat it after all. With no source of food, Toka believes he will starve to death or he ever makes it out of here, he has no energy left in his body, but then he notices the color of his magic bag changing and since that's the only source of light he has, he frantically rushes over to supply it with more mana. However, as he does so he feels something appear inside the bag and to his delight he finds a bag of beef jerky and a bottle of soda, he excitedly begins eating, while this means his hunger problem is solved for now, he doesn't know for sure if he will be able to get the bag produce food again. As days continue to pass inside the ruins, Toka has gotten used to committing mass monster genocide with his skills, but he is worried that he might be losing his humanity because of this. Back on Earth after suffering abuse at the hands of his stepfather, Toka was on the verge of having his murderous villain arc right then and there, but before he could lose his sense of humanity, he was rescued by his aunt and uncle who took him in and gave him a sense of normalcy, he learned empathy from them and he thought he had become a normal person like them. Right now, as he is staring at the mountain of corpses beneath his feet, he feels nothing at all, there's no going back to how he was before so Toka just accepts that he's a psychopath now and moves on. As he goes, he comes across another action of the ruins with the floating eyeball monster, but Toka just takes it out with his poison. As he moves forward, he comes across a door with a magic lock and upon opening it he finds a small room with two skeletons inside, he assumed they must have been people that were disposed of by Vicius as well, but they weren't fortunate enough to make it out alive, he searches through the things and finds a pouch full of gems, so while he feels bad about stealing from the dead, the gems could be valuable and he could use them once he gets out of here so he no longer feels bad about it. He goes through the other rooms nearby as well and eventually comes across one that takes a large amount of mana to open, once he finally unlocks it, he finds a skeleton sitting with a note next to it, the note says that the skeleton was once a man known as Anglin the Great Sage, and he was the former hero of darkness, the same one Vicius had mentioned was the strongest of them all. According to Anglin's note, Vicius sent him here by force after she no longer has a need for him as a hero, and while he was powerful enough to make it this far, he clearly couldn't escape, so he left a message to help the next person who could manage to make it this far. Vicius may have said the demon lord was evil, but she's just as bad in Toka's eye, although we can't say he is much better than her either, since his only goal is to get revenge on her and he doesn't care if he has to destroy the world to do it. As he's looting Anglin's corpse, he comes across a book of forbidden arts, and it is full of information about recipes for medicine and magic tool instructions that could prove to be useful later, so he decides to keep it, he also finds a scroll of forbidden magic, but he doesn't understand what it says. However, if a great sage like Anglin, went through all the trouble of keeping it hidden with him up until his final moments, then it must be really powerful and it may even be strong enough for Toka to eventually defeat the goddess if he's ever able to decipher it. Toka is just about ready to leave, but before he goes, he steals Anglin's cloak because it's cooler than his old one, and takes a look at Anglin's book again, but this time he sees a bloody warning telling him to beware of the Soul Eater, and the ominous warning has me mourning wondering if the Soul Eater is the one who killed Anglin. Toka continues making his way through the ruins until he comes across a door that he thinks will lead to the surface. However, this is truly the final door then that must mean the Soul Eater Anglin was talking about this here as well, Toka remains cautious of his surroundings and takes a look at his stats to make sure he is prepared for this, he did all he could to ensure he leveled up as much as possible before he got here, so we can only hope that his skills are enough to defeat it. Toka eventually finds a creepy face and he is certain that this must be the Soul Eater, so he immediately attempted to use Paralyze on it, but the second he steps out of cover, the Soul Eater fires a laser into his hand, this is the first time anything has managed to stop him from using his skill and Toka has to kill it, since the only way out is to use the gem on his forehead. To activate his skill, he needs to say it out loud and be within a certain distance, but none of that matters if the Soul Eater can attack him before he finishes casting the spell, while Toka is still thinking about what to do the Soul Eater breaks out of the wall to go after him, so he really has no choice but to fight now. Meanwhile, outside the ruins a girl is trying to escape from her pursuers and decides to hide nearby not knowing their fierce battle is taking place inside. As the Soul Eater slowly approaches Toka, he wonders why it hasn't fired its lasers at him yet, but he soon finds out why as the Soul Eater spits up some purple gum which takes the form of humans, these are the souls of the people the Soul Eater has killed, and they are being forced to attack Toka so if he's forced to paralyze them. However, he can't bring himself to use poison because they are still human, even if they become gross globs of paste, 
the Soul Eater enjoys watching as Toka struggles because he can't attack the souls for moral reasons, and he can't attack the Soul Eater either because it would react too fast. Toka begins breaking down and crying a lot because he says he doesn't want to hurt other people, and he's losing aura by the minute with his constant crying, but as the Soul Eater is reveling in Toka's tears, he reveals that it was all an act as he paralyzes the Soul Eater. He knew he could never land a successful paralyze on the Soul Eater unless he managed to get it to lower its guard, so if he pretended to be in the middle of a mental crisis just so the Soul Eater wouldn't suspect anything and now that the Soul Eater is paralyzed. Toka doesn't really care what happens to the souls if he kills the Soul Eater, and even though he spent so much time trying to become a harmless law-abiding citizen, all he cares about are facts. Those soul puppets were trying to kill him so they could be babies all he cares he's still going to poison them anyway, the Soul Eater struggles to move out of frustration that it lost to Toka, and this lets Toka know that powerful monsters can try to overcome his paralysis, but it does additional damage to their bodies, that's interesting at all but he doesn't want to waste any more time here. So he casts poison on the Soul Eater and destroys it once and for all. Upon doing so, the souls that the Soul Eater consumed are released, and they all appear in front of Toka to thank him for freeing them, they've been rooting for him as he tried to survive the ruins, and none of them really mind the fact that he looted their bodies either. Toka is then approached by Anglin and he has only one thing to say, he wants Toka to take down the goddess and avenge them all, the souls of the dead pass on after that and while Toka normally wouldn't accept a request without some sort of compensation, he was already planning on taking her down anyway, and now that the final monster has been defeated, Toka can open the door and begin his quest for revenge on the surface. Meanwhile, Toka's classmates are all busy hunting to level up, and while Oyamata is busy chasing down a wolf, Takuto easily annihilates the monster with his Dragonic Burst, putting him at level 18, and Yasu is just having a blast with his powers over here. Meanwhile, on the other side of the forest, this girl is having a hard time coming to terms with the situation, but all of a sudden she's approached by Asagi, who warns Kabato that she can't be spacing out like that, otherwise she'll end up getting herself killed. The reason she came over is because she wanted to discuss something with her, so she begins talking about how sooner or later the class is going to split defections. There are a lot of powerful douchebag in the class, including her, so there's no way they'll keep getting along much longer. That's why when the class eventually divides, she was Kabato to join her faction, besides it's not like that Kabato has many other options considering she's deranked, there's no way she'll be accepted into Takuto's S ranked group while being deranked, the Takao sisters only ever team up with each other, and Ayaka probably going to end up dead before long. Kabato was shocked to hear that but Asagi continues by saying Kabato needs to think long and hard about her future since she may end up with nowhere to go, and while Asagi probably won't need her help much since she's beranked, she happens to be an Opai enthusiast, and she's particularly fond of Kabato for that reason. Now that Kabato was on board with joining the group, Asagi calls for the other girls to bring over the monster they captured, she knows Kabato hasn't been able to complete the assignment that Goddess gave them so she prepared things to make it easier for her. Now all she needs to do is kill the defenseless monster and Asagi urges her to do it unless she wants to end up getting disposed of like Toka, Kabato doesn't want to do it but she knows she has no choice, so she sucks at her morals and slays the monster. Asagi praises Kabato for doing a good job and says she's officially part of the group, but Kabato is still struggling to accept what she just did. Elsewhere, Ayaka was woken up from her coma and the pain in her stomach reminds her of what must have happened to Toka after the goddess got punched her, and she feels really guilty for not being able to stop it, so she goes on to complain to Viseus and Viseus is really trying to play the part of the caring goddess with all the fake tears. But she says the disposal of the weak is the policy of the alien kingdom so there's nothing she can do about it. Viseus also informs Ayaka that she doesn't have much time to wallow in sadness over it either since while she was knocked out her classmates headed out to the forest to see if they were able to kill monsters or not, and many of them ended up failing the requirements of the test, thus were disposed of. Ayaka asks Viseus intends to kill off any heroes who she deems to be weak but Viseus claims is alien's policy so it's not her fault, even though she's a literal goddess, so Viseus say how things are going so she wants to make it clear to Viseus that she doesn't approve how things are being handled. Viseus doesn't see what the problem is since it's common sense that all the worthless people should be disposed of, so Ayaka asks Viseus if she is a valuable hero since she is S-class, Viseus answers that Ayaka is indeed very valuable so Ayaka proposes a deal, she will go above and beyond as an s rank hero to make up for the weaknesses of the people who failed, so she asks that Viseus stop the disposal plan. 
Vizia says she can agree to those terms, so she extends her hand to make it official. She also wants to apologize for punching Ayaka in the stomach, but she still thinks she was justified in doing so since Ayaka was acting hysterical over the situation. Ayaka clearly isn't fooled by Vizia's and nice act, but she's got no other choice at the moment, so she agrees to shake her hand, but as she leaves, she notes that Vizia's hands were ice cold just like her heart probably. Meanwhile, in the dark forest, a girl's trying to escape her pursuers and she had thought she lost them, they are way too good at tracking, based on nothing more than a broken leaf, Megat's Bladens is able to tell exactly where the princess knight ran off to, she may be able to conceal herself, but if she keeps making working mistakes like these, the holy watchers be sure to catch up to her sooner or later. At the same time, Toka is just about to head out into the forest in hopes of finding a city but before he does, he checks his stats one last time and notes that only his mana is exceptionally high at 50,000, while the rest of his stats hover around 5k. But he already knew that, so he really wants to confirm as the new abilities he got with his skills leveling up, he is now able to dispel Paralyze and Poison and will or partially dispel it just to avoid killing his target immediately. That's going to be pretty useful when it comes to extracting information, so he decides to test it out on the next monster he encounters. For now, he's going to need a blade or more specifically, someone who could act as a tank and handle the front lines for him. Just then, he hears some rustling in the bushes, so he goes over to check it out and finds a bunch of slimes ending up on a single smaller slime, and he decides to stand there and watch as the smaller slime goes through his bullying character arc. Once the small slime learns to fight back, Toka is satisfied so he paralyzes them all and uses the opportunity to test out the dispel option, he dispels the paralysis on the bully slimes first to get them to leave. And once they are gone, he tells the smaller slime that it doesn't need to worry since he has no intention of killing it, he's about to let it go as well but before that he wants to apologize for not helping sooner, enjoyed seeing the little guy stand up for himself so he tells the slime that it did well and after releasing it he heads off on his way. The slime doesn't really know what to do now since it doesn't have any slime friends to go back to, so decides to follow Toka instead. Toka eventually notices that he's being followed but he doesn't mind since he could use the company. Meanwhile, the Princess Knight is currently exhausted from all the running she's had to do, but here with the distance she has covered, she can still sense the presence of the Holy Watchers nearby, so they must just be waiting for the tire out so they can capture her. Toka and the slime that bonded a little so slime is now sitting in the back of Toka's jacket to keep watch while he takes a look at the spell book. After flipping through some pages, Toka finds the full bitten art he was looking for and it's one that's meant to strengthen monsters. There are even instructions on how to strengthen slimes in particular so this will come in handy for Toka, but he understands why it's classified as a forbidden art since these could cause a lot of chaos in the wrong hands. Before he does anything else, Toka talks to the slime and tells it that he is on a quest for revenge so if the slime isn't okay with that, this is his last chance to back out. The slime sign says he wants to stick by Toka's side so Toka names at Pigamaru and prepares to continue with his journey. The fleeing princess knight can sense that the holy watchers are closing in on her, so while she hoped she wouldn't have to use it, she's forced to activate her spirit contract. She offers up her sleepless payment and even does the old Power Rangers transformation routine, but as the Holy Washers finally catch up, they are shocked to find out that they've been tracking the wrong person since Toka definitely isn't their target. Now they could have just ignored Toka since he has nothing to do with their mission, but they're too scummy to do something like that, so one tells Toka to drop all his valuables so they don't have to kill him, but the other guy says he's still going to kill Toka anyway because it'll be fun. They also talked about doing terrible things to his corpse so Toka has already decided that these guys have got to go and watch them real quick, while the scumbags aren't paying attention. Toka starts shuffling away slowly and while the group notices and think he was trying to escape, Toka was actually just trying to get them all within his field of vision. Toka plays the part of his scared weakling well but as Megat's attempts to slice him up, he wastes no time in paralyzing him along with all his teammates, since it was successful Toka now knows that his status effects work on humans as well, so Vicius is probably the only person who's immune to them. Back to the Holy Watchers, these guys weren't as intimidating as the monsters he had to fight in the ruins, but their malicious intent was far worse so Toka has no issue with killing them since they tried to kill him first, he casts his poison and after all the Holy Watchers are dead, Toka spends some time looting their corpses, but then both he and Pigamaru sent some nearby. Meanwhile, the Princess Knight has been standing in battle position for a while now and she just noticed that she can no longer feel the presence of the Holy Watchers in the forest, but she thinks it must be some kind of trap to get her to lower her guard. 
However, just then she senses someone else in the forest and it's freaking her out. This guy's presence isn't immensely powerful but for some reason, the spirits are scared of him. Just then she hears something behind her, so she attacks. However, it turns out to be Pigamaru who is acting as a distraction from Toka, and with the girl's back turned Toka paralyzes her. She sensed her intent to attack but it wasn't out of malice so Toka grew curious and thought they could chat for a bit. Although he doesn't let her move as a precaution, she asks him what he wants from her, so Toka explains that he's not from around here and needs help learning about the area, so he was hoping she could make herself useful. Before that, she asked about the other four guys that were in the forest so Toka tells her that he killed them, the girl was shocked so Toka asks if it's a problem that he killed them, but she says she is just surprised that Toka was able to defeat the Holy Watchers on his own. She can sense that Toka isn't lying to her, probably thinning stone of her abilities, so she agrees to answer any questions Toka and may have for her in return for saving her life from the Holy Watchers. Toka can tell that this girl isn't a bad person so he trusts her a little more now, but there are still some things that he would rather keep to himself though and the same goes for the girl, so they both agree not to pry into each other's personal matters. As the timer for paralysis counts down Toka asks a lot of questions and learns that this place isn't even alien, he's currently in a place called the Kingdom of Olza, so the goddess disposed of him and someone else's kingdom. Toka still has one last question for the girl so he pulls out a page from the Forbidden Arts book and asks the girl if she understands it, the girl is able to recognize that it is some sort of ancient script, but that was as much as she could say since she wasn't able to read it either. However, she says she may know someone who can understand that writing, so she tells me Marie about the Witch of Taboos, she possesses such vast knowledge of forbidden techniques that she was deemed too dangerous and was driven from her homeland. Toka asks where he should go if she wants to find her so the girl instructs him to go to the land of the golden-eyed monsters, but it's a treacherous part of the continent. Toka thanks her for the valuable information, but the girl doesn't feel like she has done enough to repay her debts since Toka saved her life. Toka says she doesn't have to worry about doing any more than this so they'll be parting ways now. The girl is fine with it as long as Toka is satisfied in Toka and can tell that she has a strong sense of honor and honesty, which reminds him a lot of his aunt who was so nice that it often made him worry about her. He tells her that the paralysis will be undone in a few minutes but he can't guarantee her safety since he will be leaving now. As Toka leaves he says he hopes the girl makes it to her destination safely and as Pigamaru returns, he asks if Toka isn't going to kill her. Toka says he wouldn't do that since he doesn't find any joy in killing, he just does it for self-defense, so there's no reason to pointlessly murder the girl. Although he can't guarantee that the girl will come after him to attack once she's free to move again, so he asked Pigamaru to keep watching his back for him. Toka soon makes it to the town and he is stopped at the front gate by a guard who is in charge of performing security checks. She assumes Toka must be a traveling mercenary who came here to conquer the mill's ruins. Toka plays along with the story and says he indeed came here to conquer the ruins, also adding that he comes from Ulza town so he doesn't know much about this place. His story seems convincing enough for the guard, so she lets him in since she has orders to allow as many mercenaries as possible into the towns. Toka is surprised by the relaxed security since there were no luggage checks or full cavity body searches, but it works out well for him since his plans are going smoothly. The first thing he does is head to an inn to get himself a room, but while he's at the front desk, Innkeeper is being pretty rude to him since he thinks Toka is a broke loser. However, little does he know Toka eluded a bunch of money off the corpses of the Holy Watchers, and as soon as he flashes a bit of cash, the innkeeper starts treating him a whole lot nicer, Toka gets to stay in a room like he wanted, and now that his accommodations have been secured, he goes out into town for a bit to survey the area and even though he's an outsider, he doesn't feel any hostility directed towards him. So he takes a leisurely stroll and comes across places like item shops and the town's adventurer's guild. This information may come in handy later but for now, Toka has gotten hungry so he turns around and heads to a nearby tavern to grab some food. He tries the food of this world for the first time and it doesn't taste great, but it's edible enough that Toka is okay eating it. He thinks this tavern is great because the people here are happy and drunk, and thus makes it easy to gather information since everyone is talking so loudly, he's able to overhear some guys talking about how the consonant is full of insanely strong people. So they having a power scaling debate about who they think is the strongest. But in the end they know that there's only one team that can hold the title of strongest, and that's the Black Dragon Knights who destroyed the Kingdom of Me. Their five dragons alone are enough to completely wipe out an army but on top of that, they got humanity's strongest and the hero's slayer, so it's a safe bet to say they would win any direct confrontation. 
After Toka has gathered a good amount of intel for the night, he takes some leftover rice back to his room so he can feed Pikimaru, and while Pikimaru is eating, he goes over his plans for the future. For now, his top priority is finding someone who knows how to read the language and the scroll of forbidden magic and the only person who would be able to do that is the Witch of Taboos. Another priority of his is to make the monster strengthening solution so he can improve the abilities of Pigamaru. But now that he's thinking about it, the nobleman of this town has been gathering mercenaries to conquer the mill's ruins, and one of the ingredients needed for the strengthening solution are the bones of the skeleton soldier, and skeleton soldiers just so happen to be found in the mill's dungeon, so Toka makes plans to head there tomorrow. The next day, all the mercenaries in town gather towards the Marquis Cred Hercule has to say, Cred tells them that a new floor within the ruins has been uncovered, so he is tasting them all with exploring set floor, and as a reward he promises that whosoever manages to acquire the dragon eye chalice that is within the ruins will receive a prize of 300 gold pieces is also willing to pay good price for any other treasures that are brought back, and the mercenaries are free to use whatever monster parts they find as they see fit. Toka is glad because that means he will be allowed to keep the skeleton bones from the ruins once he acquires them. Now that everyone is clear on the terms, they all line up to begin registration, but while Toka is waiting in line, he never sees a commotion going on at the other end of the line. There's this random guy constantly yapping about how one girl in line is really pretty. In fact, She's so pretty that he could swear if she was a princess, or maybe even a princess knight of the destroyed kingdom of Ni, and who wasn't bounty on her head perhaps. We see what happened was that a couple years back this guy tried asking the princess knight out on date, but she said no. And from that day onwards, he had burned her face, voice, and chest into his toka so he could get his revenge someday, and she went to great lengths to ensure her face was covered, so the man has to have some degenerate skill if he was able to recognize her just from her opi. Anyway, to prove that he is right about her identity, he reaches over to pull off her cloak and show the crowd her face, but as he does so, he is shocked to find out that the girl's face isn't the same as that of Princess Sarah's Ashrain, and the girl now states that her name is Miss Belucas. He never misidentifies Opie, so he knows that she must be Ashrain, but he has no way of proving it, so he swears to get his revenge on Mist as well as every beautiful woman that has made him look like a fool. A little while later, Toka is planning on going shopping for some supplies to use during the mission, but as he is walking, the girl approaches him to ask if he's here to explore the dungeon as well. Toka recognizes her and feels sympathetic that she has to deal with so many people trying to reveal her identity, but she says it's not that much of a problem since she disguised her face ahead of time. Still, Toka suggests she be careful about guys like that, because even if he doesn't know her real identity for now, he seems like he's petty enough to try attacking her, just because she made him look like a fool in front of everyone. But that said, Toka tells her that he has a request he would like to make, so he explains that he has no idea about the value of the items in this town, so he would like her to help him negotiate so that he doesn't get swindled. And of course, he isn't asking her to do this for free as he promises to compensate her for her assistance if she accepts, she decides to accept his offer since she's pretty much broke right now, so that two shake hands and she introduces herself to him as her alias, Mist while Toka introduces himself under the name Hattie. The two of them proceed to go shopping together and since Mist went negotiated for him, she ultimately saves Toka's around 3 silver coins worth and deals, so he gives that to her as her compensation. She's surprised to receive this much money just for shopping with him, but Toka believes is a fair reward for the help she offered him, so she accepts the payment and is about to leave, but as she attempts to walk away, she ends up collapsing to the ground. Toka asked her if she is alright and she says she's okay, but she hasn't been able to sleep well for the past few days so she's a little tired, she then turns and leaves so Toka leaves things as they are and decides to head to the ruins to be in hunting for skeletons. Within the ruins as Toka descending the stairs, he hears some mercenaries scream as they run past him that there's a little ox demon down there so Toka assumes it must be a miniature version of the minotaurs that he had to fight in the ruins of disposal. The ox demon charges towards him, but Toka quickly paralyzes and poisons it, so it wasn't much of a threat to him, and he stabs the ox demon to test whether the demon's skin is as tough as the ones in the abandoned ruins, but this one is much easier to stab. A little while later those mercenaries that ran away earlier return with backup to defeat the ox demon, and when they find it dead, they are shocked that someone was actually capable of killing a monster like this so quickly. Toka heads deeper into the ruins, but despite the place crawling with monsters, he isn't feeling very threatened by any of them since they are easy to kill. He isn't getting much experience from killing the monsters either, so he decides to head a little deeper into the ruins to find some strong monster. 
While walking through the halls, he happens to overhear that loser from earlier talking to a couple of mercenaries, and he's asking them to go after Mist and make her regret ever being born, all because she didn't want to go on a date with him and made him look like he was wrong about her identity. So he can't let her continue to live in this world and preferably, he wants the mercenaries make her suffer as much as possible before killing her so he can see the twisted look of despair on her. At first, the mercenaries thought it was messed up to go this far just because someone ignored him, but money is money so they agreed to do it and start talking about how they will torture her. Toka overhears all of this and since he is sure these guys are irredeemable scumbags at this point, and he's not about to let them get away with their plans to kill Mist so he steps out to confront them. As soon as they see him, they all threaten to kill Toka but Toka just raises his hand and paralyzes them all, he then inflicts poison on them and it feels oddly satisfying to eliminate scumbags when he gets the chance. After the scumbags are dead, Toka continues his venture into the ruins but before he heads to the next level, he decides to take a little break. Three hours later, Toka wakes up from his nap and thanks Pigamaru for being a lookout in case any monster showed up, he exits the room to head to the next floor, but before he can do that, he runs into a team of mercenaries and they tell them to be careful since there's a lot of strange stuff happening in these ruins. People have been coming across a lot of monster corpses, but it's not clear what killed the monsters since there are no clear signs of attack, it pretty much looks like the monsters fell over dead in the middle of the ruins. As the leader of the Saber Tigers party, Lily Adamantin values the lives of her teammates more than anything else, so while she would normally continue with the ruins exploration, she has made the decision to back out and head back to the surface. She even offers to let Toka come with her, but Toka says she wants to continue with the ruins exploration so Lily and the rest of her team wishes him good luck with that, Toka knows all the unexplained deaths are because of him but it works out well in his favor since if people believe there's something strange going on in the ruins that means fewer mercenaries will show up in the ruins. Toka heads down deeper until he finally arrives at the room where the Dragon Eye Chalice is located and there's a giant gargoyle statue right beside it, but it's totally harmless so there's no need to worry about it. Yet, Toka isn't stupid so he casts Paralyzed and Poison on the statue and sure enough, it turns out to be a monster and it soon ends up dying. Toka has now officially obtained the Dragon Chalice and soon after he acquires it, Mist shows up and is disappointed that she didn't manage to get here first. Toka doesn't really care about the chalice so he says Mist can have it if she wants, she can't believe Toka would give her something worth 300 gold coins, so she asks what she wants in return, but Toka honestly doesn't need anything from her. Mist said she can't accept something so valuable for free, but Toka says she should just hurry up and take it, and she should probably get some proper sleep soon otherwise she will end up collapsing. She still doesn't feel right accepting this, so Toka tells her that he never cared about the cup in the first place, what he's really after is located further down in the ruins, so Mist offers to act as his guard while he's down there. Right now, the only thing she can think to offer him is her skill with her sword and she promises not to be hindrance, so Toka agrees under few conditions. The first condition is that neither of them asks too many questions about each other's personal lives, and he won't necessarily be returning to the surface within a day, so if Mist wants to return by herself, Toka won't be responsible for her safety. Mist agrees to the terms, so they head down to the next floor and Mist shows Toka just how useful she can be as she cuts down a giant flower monsters. Toka is impressed, but there's something he would like to ask her about, he has noticed that some monsters have golden eyes while others don't, so he was wondering what the difference is between them. Mist explains that monsters with golden eyes are said to contain experience, so they are the perfect prey for monsters, the heroes of another world to level up. She has no idea that Toka is one of said heroes, so she was on to explain that heroes gain no experience from killing humans, so experience for them is something that is unique to monsters, and in regards to monsters without golden eyes they are just regular monsters and can even form friendly relationships with humans under the right circumstances. According to legends, the Demon King radiates a powerful energy known as Demon Essence, and monsters which are affected by this essence become incredibly violent and how their eyes turn gold. Before they go any further, Toka suggests they take a break so Mist can get some sleep, but she says she doesn't need any sleep since she's meant to be guarding Toka, but he eventually convinces her to lie down, and once she does, he casts sleep on her so she can get some proper rest. Meanwhile, the Black Dragon Knights have just come across the site where the Holy Watchers were killed and their leader, Civic Gartland, is excited to face the person who's strong enough to take out the Holy Watchers so easily. After a few hours, Toka's sleep effect wears off, so Mist Disguise returns as she wakes up as she has no idea how she fell asleep since her pack should still be in effect. 
She looks around for Toka and to her relief, it looks like he was sleeping the entire time so he couldn't have seen her true identity. However, Toka is just pretending to sleep so she doesn't become paranoid, and once he pretends to wake up they continue their journey further into the dungeon. They soon arrive at another room, and while it looks like it's empty, Toka hears an unsettling sound, so he warns Mist back away from the door and moments later, a skeleton king emerges. Toka can tell if the skeleton king is much stronger than any other monster they faced till now, but Mist believes they should be able to slay if they target the silver part on its chin, that's a pretty obvious weak spot, but the skeleton king is still a formidable monster, it is so strong that it would take all the members of the Saber Tiger party to defeat it. The Skeleton King seems to think Mist is the biggest threat here so she's likely going to get targeted first. She needs to get ready to defend herself, so she tells Toka that she's about to use her trump card, but she would like it to remain a secret for as long as possible, so she asked him to keep it between them. Mist also apologizes in advance because if the monster exceeds her expectations and she may not be able to defend Toka as she promised earlier. Toka agrees that the Skeleton King is strong and fighting it would probably be rather troublesome, so he decides to use his ability and paralyze the monster. Mist is shocked on the monster freezes in place and even more so when Toka poisons it and defeats the monster in world record time. Now that it has been defeated, Toka begins collecting the bones from the Skeleton King and confirms that these are the ones the recipe requires. He says they can head back to the surface now, but he can tell that Mist has dozens of questions to ask him, so he says he will give her some answers as long as the questions are too invasive. Just then, Pigamara gets Toka's attention and tells him that there's something interesting over by the skeleton, so Toka goes to take a look and he indeed finds something interesting, it's a magic cloth with an egg wrapped inside it, and while he has no idea what to do with it, he decides to take it with him regardless. Meanwhile, Toka's classmates are all running away in fear after encountering a group of skeleton soldiers, and this girl in particular is freaking out on the floor over her dismembered hand, but there are still skeletons approaching to dismember more than her hand, so Ayaka is trying to step up and defend her weaker classmates, but Oyamana doesn't give a shit about his classmates and runs and blasting the skeletons. Same as Takuto, although he nearly kills his classmates as well, but why would he care about them? He just hit level 24 so he is too busy patting himself on the back for a job well done. Meanwhile, Toka and Mist have made it back to the surface and Mist presents the dragon chalice so she can receive her reward, and while the crowd surrounds her to get a look at the chalice, Toka quietly walks away since he's gotten everything he needs from the mill's ruins. After a while, Mist catches up to Toka and tells him that an award ceremony is going to be held tomorrow where she will be awarded her prize money, so she's still going to need to stay in town till then. Since she's not busy for the rest of the day, Toka asks if he can have a chat with her in private, he asks if they can meet up in his room later tonight and Mist is fine with that, so Toka turns to leave, but before he goes she grabs Toka by the arm and thanks him once again for giving her the dragon chalice. Later that night, Pigamaru is eating his dinner while Toka prepares the monster strengthening solution, and just as he finishes making it, Mist arrives at his door. Toka lets her inside and he gets right to the point as he tells Mist that he wants to hire her as his bodyguard, Mist is rather surprised by the proposal, but Toka thought it would be a win-win since she would get extra travel funds, but then again, if she receives the 300 gold coins then she probably won't need to worry about money for a while. In any case, he pulls out a map and tells Mist that his goal is to reach the Witch of Taboos and the Land of the Golden Eyed Monsters, he is expecting to get sworn by a large number of monsters on his journey at least once, so he would feel a lot better if he had a capable warrior there to watch his back for him. And after working with her in the mill's ruin, he believes Mist would be the perfect bodyguard for him. Mist happens to be on her way to Yanato, which means she could company Toka quite conveniently, but she is still hesitant to accept the offer for some reason. Toka notices this and tells her that there's no rush to answer right away, besides he had something he wanted to discuss with Sarah's first anyway, it takes her a moment to realize that Toka just called her by her real name. And once she does, she asks me more how he knew about her real identity. Toka reveals that he was the one who put her to sleep back in the dungeon and as such, he saw her real face. It's clear that she was hesitating to accept his offer because she was worried about how difficult it would be to keep her identity secret from him while traveling together which is probably the reason she refused to sleep while working with Toka earlier, he assures her that he has no intention of selling her out for any reason, so she doesn't have to worry about him betraying her. 
Ceres reveals that she uses the power of spirits to conceal her identity but in exchange, she has to forego her desire to sleep. That's why she returns to normal when she goes to sleep, and it's also the reason why the Holy Watchers were chasing her back in the forest, since they managed to spot her while she was asleep and didn't have her disguise. She begins to undo her disguise as she tells Toka that she's grateful for him killing the Holy Watchers, since she has a lot less to worry about now. Toka asks if the fact that she removed her disguise around him means that she trusts him now and Sarah's confirms that she believes he's a trustworthy person, she is officially agrees to act as Toka's bodyguard and the two shake hands to mark their new partnership. Toka reaches into his bag and pulls out a blue gem to give to Sarah's as her payment, but Sarah's is stunned as he hands it to her because this thing is an authentic blue dragon gem. Toka doesn't know what the big deal is since it's just one of the gems he looted in the abandoned ruins, so Ceres explains that gems like this are incredibly rare and are even worth way more than the dragon chalice. Toka doesn't really care that the gem is valuable, so he tells Ceres she could still keep the gem anyway. Ceres doesn't want to accept it because it is worth way too much, but Toka has a whole bag full of them, so he insists that she keep the gem. Ceres finally relents and agrees to accept the gem as payment, but before they go their separate ways for today, Toka says they should still call each other by their aliases to protect their identities when they are out in public. Ceres agrees to this and since they will be working together for a while, she thinks she should inform Toka of the reason why she's on the run. However, Toka tells her he doesn't need to know that he has no interest in prying into her past unnecessarily, nor does he want her to feel pressured into telling him anything. The next day, Toka and Sarah's are having breakfast together and Toka takes the opportunity to ask her if she happens to know anything about forbidden magic. Sarah's tells him that it is magic that has been prohibited by Viseus, but they are generally understood to be specific ancient spells. The only reason the spells are forbidden is because Viseus said so and the people don't like questioning her. If Viseus went through the trouble to personally outlaw the forbidden spells then it is very likely that she did so because the spells could be dangerous to her. Unfortunately, Ceres doesn't have any more information on the forbidden spells, but Toka says she's giving him a good amount of info, so he's thankful. After breakfast, Ceres says she needs to go to the award ceremony so she can get her prize, so she will meet back up with me more in the afternoon, and after going their separate ways, Toka decides to head into the forest and test out that monster strengthening potion he made. Meanwhile, at the reception for Sarah's an illusionist was hired to make sure the dragon chalice was the real thing, and this wouldn't be an issue normally, but Sarah's has a bad feeling about this since she's using illusion magic to hide her identity. Hours go by and Sarah's still has a return like she had said she would, so Toka is starting to get rather worried. Meanwhile, Viseus is having a meeting with Ayaka over the recent ruin expedition to the ruins that the class took, and Ayaka asks if Viseus can take care of Sakura since she got her hand cut off. Viseus agrees to heal the girl, but she makes it clear that she's only doing it because Sakura is B-rank, otherwise if she were something like D-rank, then health insurance wouldn't be available for her. By the way, Viseus asks Ayaka if she is considered joined Takuto team, but Ayaka can't imagine herself getting along with Takuto when he cares so little about the lives around him. Viseus calls Ayaka's decision selfish, so Ayaka starts trying to explain herself, but Viseus tells her she's an obligated to justify herself. Although she wants to know if Ayaka is still committed to saving this world since she isn't putting in as much effort as an S-rank adventurer should. Ayaka asserts that she's fulfilling her duties as an S-rank in her own way, so Viseus agrees to let her do as she pleases, but she also says that Ayaka will be tasked with taking care of those who couldn't pass the trials. Viseus ones are trained them but Ayaka against the idea, since the original deal was that she would fight on behalf of the weak ones. Viseus claims that a royal decree ordered her to dispose of all heroes who aren't capable of fighting, so Viseus wants Sober to train them so they can learn to kill monsters and of course, if Sober refuses Viseus will immediately dispose of her weak classmates, so Ayaka doesn't really have much of a choice here. She's forced to agree to Viseus' terms and as she is leaving Viseus points out that if any of her classmates become a hindrance to her, she may have to deal with them herself, but of course it's not like she wants to get rid of them or anything. Back to Toka, more time has passed and Sarah still isn't back yet, so either she ditched him or something happened to her, and considering how honest she's been thus far, the only possibility is that she got abducted, she has no reason to even want to lie to Toka in the first place because we gain nothing from doing so. As Toka is on his way to go looking for Sarah's, he hears two guys talking about how Sarah's identity was revealed during the banquet, and she was forced to flee into the forest to escape, but Mills is organizing a hunting party to go after her, and this hunting party consists of the Black Dragon Knights. 
As the knights chase after Sarah's, she attempts to transform using her spirit regalia, but her spirit of light got disoriented with her disguise was destroyed, so she won't be able to transform for now and has to fight in base form. She manages to take out a couple of the lower ranked knights, but it was really difficult for her, so she fears what might happen if one of the higher ranking members were to attack her now. Just then, she notices an arrow being fired at her from behind, but she can tell that it is just a distraction, so she quickly rushes to face her real opponent, the Dragon Knight's vice captain. He is a much tougher foe than the rest of them so she struggles to defend herself, and she unfortunately loses her footing, so the vice captain disarms her as she falls to the ground and gets on top of her. He is about to do unspeakable things, but before he actually does anything, Toka arrives and paralyzes him. Saris is shocked to see Toka here, but she knows she's safe now so she climbs out from under the vice captain and Toka gives him a non-lethal dose of poison for good measure. Saris asked me more why he came looking for her but before their conversation goes any further, Toka puts the vice captain into sleep so he can't overhear them. Saris warns Toka that if he stays with her then he will be pursued by the black dragon knights as well, so she's willing to return the gem he gave her and nullify their contract so that she doesn't cause him any trouble. Toka tells her that won't be necessary because for one he has a lot of those gems, so the money isn't an issue for him but more importantly, he isn't going to find another bodyguard home he can trust like Sarah's, so he's going to stick with her. And right now, he needs Sarah's to take off her clothes. The story continues, we see after an awkward pause Toka clarifies that he's only saying this because the people in town already saw her in the clothes she's wearing now, so she'll be easily recognized if she doesn't get changed soon. Sarah's is relieved to hear that and Toka tells her that he also has a proposal to make to her. He says she can try and negotiating with the Witch of Taboos to have her shelter Sarah's for the time being. No one has ever managed to figure out where the witch lives yet, so it should be a safe place for Sarah's to hide, and Toka is heading there anyway so he and Sarah's can keep their original agreement for her to be his bodyguard. Sarah's is grateful that Toka is looking out for her, but she wonders why he's going so far to help her when they barely know one another. It may seem strange to her, but he explains that Sarah's reminds him of someone very precious to him, so if he were to abandon her here, it would feel like he had abandoned his aunt and he can't do that. Sarah's once again thanks Toka for being so kind to her, and now that they've settled their agreement, Toka goes over to the vice captain and partially dispels the paralysis will allow him to speak. The vice captain immediately begins threatening Toka for daring to oppose a member of the Dragon Knight, but Toka is in phase and gives him an ultimatum. He can tell him what the Dragon Knights are planning and if he does, Toka will show mercy to him. Otherwise, he's going to die slow and painful death. The man tries to act cool and confident, but he ultimately agrees to tell Toka and Sarah's what they want to know what before he can spill the beans, his brains get spilled all over the floor by a sword from the sky. Toka and Sarah's turn around to get a look at the attacker and to his horror, not only is the attacker out of range but it's actually Griffith, I mean Sivit. He has many names across this world, but he's most commonly referred to by the title of Humanity Strongest. Sivit and his five dragon riders are all here aside from the one whose brains are all over the floor though. Orvin asks Sivit if it was really necessary to kill him, but Sivit doesn't really care about casualties as long as the mission is complete. They're ordered to do this by Ordola and that name seems to be familiar to Sarah's, so she's frozen in shock. At the same time, Ordola is lying in his bed and agonizing over the thought what he has done. He never wanted to hurt Sarah's because he loved her like a daughter and more specifically, like a stepdaughter because he explicitly states that seeing her always had him focus and stiff. He does not regret letting her escape rather what he regrets is the fact that some other man could be having romantic relations with her, so we decided that the best course of action here was to kill her instead. Sarah's can't believe Ordola would do something like that, but it's the truth. In fact, that's what Gizan was going to tell her, but since Sivit thought he was being a hindrance he threw his sword and killed him, although if Gizan had managed to dodge it somehow then Sivit would have let him live, but even if Gizan had been paralyzed by Toka there was no way he could have dodged an attack like that. The Dragon Rider asks what they should do with Sarah's now and according to the orders Ordola gave him, he wants Sarah's to be killed and her dead body to be brought back to him and intact, at which point necrophilia is on the table for him. Sarah's still can't believe that Ordola would order something like this, but Sivit tells her that he's willing to give her the chance to earn her life back. He's obsessed with finding strong opponents, so if Sarah's can be him in a duel and then he will let her go free, he's been here to test out the famous spirit regalia of hers, which is why he was so motivated to catch up to her, but right now, he's a lot more interested in Toka more than in Sarah's. 
Toka is sweating bullets because he's at risk of being killed at any moment and Sibit and his team are all still slightly out of range for his ability, so his options for counterattack are limited, but he with this dire situation, Toka still has a smile on his face as he takes a gamble. He asks Sibit if he can talk with him as he slowly makes his way forward, but Sibit asks him to identify himself first. Toka introduces himself under the name Hattie but Civic can immediately tell that it's a fake name and if Toka has a reason to want to hide his name then there must be some kind of story behind it. The Dragon Riders don't understand why Sivit is even listening to a random boy in the first place, but Sivit finds it interesting that Toka shows no fear despite being fronted by the strongest party on the continent. In fact, Sivit can tell that Toka looks like he is preparing to attack or something, and almost no one ever even considers attacking Sivit, so he knows Toka must be at least a bit special. Toka asks Sivit if it is true that he is currently searching for a worthy opponent to give him a battle he will be satisfied with and Sivit confirms this to be true, but if that's the case, Toka asks why Sivit doesn't go after some more obviously strong people. For example, the goddess Viseus and the heroes, Sivit explains that he has a non-aggression pact with Viseus so he can't fight her, but he still has hope in the heroes who had been summoned by Viseus, since he had heard the story of how heroes start out weak, but over time build up an incredible amount of strength, so he's patiently waiting for the day when one of them becomes strong enough to challenge him. It would be great if they have power necessary to kill him too since Sivit has been bored with life recently, with how he is always the best at everything. Out of courtesy for Toka, Sivit even offers to kill Saras painlessly and have her head delivered to the current princess of Ni. Nee. Saras is asked why he would need to do that so Sivit informs her that her escape led to all I am becoming hostile to this kingdom and recently, they even invaded because the goddess demanded that Saras be handed over to her but Emperor Ordola refused. At this point that Toka speaks up and makes an interesting proposal to Sivit, he says that if Sivit is truly looking for an opponent that is capable of killing him then Toka can become that opponent for him. Earlier Sivit mentioned that he has high hopes that the summoned heroes will become strong enough to defeat him so Toka reveals that he is in fact one of these summoned heroes. Sivit is able to detect whether someone is lying or not so he can tell that Toka is telling the truth, he asks what he's doing all the way out here if he's a hero, so Toka says that he holds a very unique position among his fellow heroes, so he was allowed to act independently by Viseus herself. Now this technically isn't a lie since Toka is the only the E rank, so he definitely is in a unique position and Viseus did say that he will be allowed to do whatever he wants if he manages to survive the abandoned ruins, so that was basically her giving permission for him to act independently. Since everything Toka said is technically true, Sivit lie detection leads him to believe that Toka must be a truly promising hero for Viseus to give him special treatment and that gets him excited, so he asks to Toka to state his proposal. Toka says he would like to defer their fight, meaning he wants Sivit to spare him until he can grow strong enough to give him the fight he has been dreaming of. Sivit is amused so he asks Toka how he intends to do that and Toka informs him of his intentions to go to the land of the Golden Eye monsters to train, but he will definitely return to Viseus sooner or later, so Sivit won't have to worry about Toka going and hiding. Everything he has said so far is convinced Sivit, so Sivit agrees to spare Toka's life so he can grow strong enough to be a worthy opponent, he tells Toka that he can leave without having to worry about being attacked. However, he still intends to kill Saras so Toka speaks up again and tells Sivit that he needs Saras in order to get through the land of golden eyed monsters, so Sivit laughs and agrees to won't harm Saras either and he won't let any of the subordinates touch her either until his duel with Toka is over. Toka is really proud of his acting skills right now because he actually managed to talk his way out of a direct fight with Sivit, but as far as training so that he can have a rematch with Sivit goes. Toka's not stupid, Sivit back is turned but he is still within range so Toka immediately seizes the opportunity he is paralyzed on Sivit and all the other dragon riders. Toka apologizes for betraying Sivit's trust, but he cannot kind enough to ignore a clear opening to attack and Toka's goal is to ultimately get revenge on the goddess, so he doesn't have time to be worrying about Sivit and the others. Sivit is enraged that he was betrayed and his title of humanity strongest isn't for nothing as he is managing to move even though he's under paralysis of the poison, but he ultimately isn't able to overcome it. As one of the dragon knights is about to die, he sets off a signal to call in all the dragon knights that were on standby in the forest and as Sivit sees them, he warns them all that they need to stay out of Toka's effective range, so they should attack from the sky. However, Toka had already thought or planned to deal with the problem of having a low range on his ability, which is why after giving Pigamaru the monster strengthening potion, he's now able to link with him. 
He has a couple downsides since it takes a long time to get into this state and it burns through his MP but once complete, he can use his slime tendrils to greatly extend the effective range of his paralyzed skill and knocks the dragon knights to the ground. Using his skills so much earn Toka a couple of new skills, he just a few out on some of the knights of which he learns that Berser is a skill that causes someone to have violent urges and darkness is a skill that dulls one's senses and sends them into a world of pitch black. Before long, all the remaining dragon knights have been killed and the only one left alive is Sivit, who is still trying to fight off the effects but he too dies shortly thereafter. Following this, Toka thanks Ceres for staying by his side and guarded him while he was fighting the dragon knights but she tells him not to mention it because it is the least she could do as his bodyguard. However, there's another threat Ceres wants to warn Toka of, she tells him about someone called the Hero Slayer, who is an aggressive man who could have potentially rivaled Sivit, but as it so happens Toka already off-screen the Hero Slayer so there aren't really any more immediate threats to them. Meanwhile, Back with the other heroes, Ayaka is getting a little worried since she hasn't awakened a special skill yet but all of a sudden, a purple-haired girl arrives and tells them all that Viseus is busy, so she will be taking over as the training instructor. Oyamata gets in her face and asks why they should listen to her in the first place, but the girl almost instantly knocks him out, so she has proven that she's strong enough to be in charge and tells everyone to get ready because they are heading back to the capital. On Toka end, he has just finished telling Sarahs about his backstory and how he wishes to get revenge on the goddess for what she did to him and Sarahs is willing to help him in any way she can, Toka has already risked his life on multiple occasions to save her, so as long as she's able to be of use to him, she will be his side. The story continues, we see at the abandoned ruins the guards in charge of making sure nothing goes wrong, arrive to check on the place and something has definitely gone wrong because the crystal for the gate has burned out. This would normally mean that someone managed to open the door from the inside and get out, so one of the guards thinks they should probably report this to Alien, but that would be too much paperwork, so the others decide it would be better to pretend nothing happened here. Besides, it's not like anyone could have actually survived the abandoned ruins and made it out alive, that would be impossible. Meanwhile, Toka have enjoying a festival in town, and he happens to pick up a cool-looking mask on sale, so the stall owner begins telling him about the Lord of Flies whose the mask is made to resemble. The Lord of Flies is the person who once turned an island of monsters into his fortress, making himself the master of the demons that were ostracized by evil itself. The Lord of Flies and his army were eventually wiped out, but because he was so cool, he remains popular to this day even though he was evil. Toka decides to buy the mask and heads into a tent to try it on, he is not exactly an upstanding hero, so a mask resembling a demon would be much more fitting for him, he once again swears to himself that he will make vicious pay for what she did to him, and his determination shouldn't be underestimated because he's literally got nothing better to do. Over in the Magnar Kingdom, the news of the downfall of the five dragons has reached the Holy Alliance, and the King of Magnar finds it quite hard to believe that the man hailed his humanity's strongest warrior was defeated overnight. The King of Ulza tells him that he personally identified the corpses of the dragon riders, so there is no doubt that they are all dead. The King of Magnar asks if the goddess of Alien has any information on the matter, so Vicious informs him that the dragon riders were apparently chasing after Sarah's where they met their demise, and while they don't know where Sarah's was headed after the fight, they did find evidence of some of Sarah's torn clothes and a lot of her blood. Judging from the amount they believe it might be possible that she was confronted with the Black Dragon Knights and killed them all, but was gravely wounded in the process and already death somewhere else. The Black Knights were humanity's best hope against the Great Demon Empire, so losing them is a huge blow to the strength of the Holy Alliance, so the heroes from another world are even more valuable than they were before. The Emperor of Mira Miradia Swordsit thinks it's funny how every time great evil comes, Alien always seems to benefit in some way. Vicious keeps her polite tone and asks Miradia Swordsit what he's trying to insinuate with his statement, but Miradia Swordsit is serious. Every time something bad happens, they are forced to rely on Alien and its heroes so it's pretty convenient for Vicious. Vicious says they are all equally affected by the Dark Lord's essence, so she's on the same side as them, but she's being very passive-aggressive towards Miradia Swordsit, so he decides to stop talking before things go too far. There's one final thing that needs to be discussed before they adjourn this meeting, so the King of Magnar asks if everyone here truly believes Sarahs was capable of killing all five of the Black Dragon Knights, it's pretty hard to believe she was capable of doing something like that on her own, and they have no idea who could have been behind it. However, a messenger comes into the room and informs him that there is a group that is taking credit for the defeat of the Black Dragon Knights, and they call themselves the Cursed Magic Users of Ashint. 
The next day, Toka and Sarah's are walking through town to stock up on supplies, and it doesn't look like anyone is following them, so this place might be the safest bet for their preparation. While walking, Toka notices is a huge coliseum nearby, so Sarah's explains that it is a blood sport coliseum where slaves and mercenaries kill each other for the entertainment of the crowd. The fighters can earn rewards by winning their matches, and since it is run by the Duke and the Mercenary Guild, it has become a prime source of entertainment for the public. Although at first it was just a way for the Mercenary Guild to assess their fighters, Sarah's and Toka later find a good inn to stay at, and since they need to conserve funds, Sarah suggests that she and Toka should share a room. Toka asks if she is really okay with that, since Toka is a man and stuff might happen. But while she's embarrassed, she says she doesn't mind, so Toka gets one room for both of them. After that, they head to the bar so they can get something to eat, and the place is pretty packed. So Toka is able to overhear a conversation about the death of the Black Dragon Knights. From what he hears, it looks like people think Sarah's died at the hands of the Dragon Knights, but then the Dragon Knights, but were taken out by someone else. A group called the Ash End is taking credit for killing the Dragon Knights with their cursed magic, and Sarah's has heard about them before. So she tells Toka that the group apparently worships the God of Curses. Just then, the Ashant walked into the bar, and they are really enjoying all the cloud they got from stealing credit for what Toka did. After getting a good look at them, Toka doesn't think they are actually that much of a threat, and he's not mad about them taking credit for what he did since it takes attention away from him. Toka continues to eavesdrop on the conversation going on around him, but then he hears people talking about who else they think might have been strong enough to defeat the Black Dragon Knights, and eventually the Witch of Taboos is mentioned. She's apparently a dark elf, and no one has actually seen her in a decade, but there's someone in the capital who has seen her before. Toka approaches the table and asks if the guys can tell him a little more about this person, and at first they don't want to talk to Toka, but when Toka offers to pay for their drinks, they are much more willing to talk to him. They tell them that the person who met the Witch of Taboos is the strongest fighter in the Colosseum, and he'd like to meet her, then he is probably going to have to talk to the owner of the Colosseum. However, Toka is in luck because the person in question just happened to walk into the bar. Toka goes up to her, introduces himself, but he immediately knows he wants something from her, so she asks him to state his business. Toka gets to the point and tells her that he would like to meet the Witch of Taboos. Even admits that she has ventured into the land of the Golden Eye monsters before, but she denies ever having met the witch. But thanks to Sarah's spirits, she's able to tell that Eve is lying when she says never met the witch before. Eve asks Toka why he wants to see the Witch of Taboos, so Toka says he is just going out of curiosity. So he advises him to stay out of the land of the Golden Eye monsters, since to be frank, he doesn't think Toka is strong enough to survive up to three days there. She tells Toka that she value his life a little more, but it's a bit hypocritical coming from her, since she routinely risks her life on stage. Later, Toka is informed by Sarah's that Eve was lying, so they can guarantee that she actually knows of the whereabouts of the witch. As he returns to his hotel room, Toka realizes that he forgot to bring some food back for Pigamaru to eat, so he decides to pull out a snack he had with him when he first arrived in this world. He also gives some to Sarah's, and she has never had anything like it before. But as soon as she puts it in her mouth, she's delighted by the wonderful taste. She asks him if it is a common snack from his world, and Toka says it is, but he unfortunately can't make any more of it. For now, they need to decide what their next move is going to be, and the first thing on the agenda is finding out the location of the witch from Eve. He needs to find a way to get her to tell him. But what would be more important to her than her life? Typically, it would be money since she buys her freedom if she has enough funds, although it requires a large sum of money. At same night, we see Eve visiting a little dark elf girl, and she promises her that she will do her best to get her out of here. Back in Toka's room, Sarah's is practicing with her spritz regalia, and it may just look like some armor with no visible boosts aside from looking cool. But I'm sure it will come in handy at some point. Once Sarah's has done training, Toka asks her if she can give him some pointers on how to handle close combat, since he has been relying on his skill a little too much lately. So he wants to be prepared if he is ever unable to use it. Sarah's understands, and she decides to train in the same way she would train one of her knights back when she was still a knight captain. She takes a step back and tells Toka to assault her, so he throws a straight punch. But Sarah's easily evades it and puts him in an arm lock. Something like this doesn't require a weapon, and it can easily be home with a few days of training. But as she says this, she realizes she's pretty close to Toka, so she takes a step back and apologizes. Toka says it is fine since he is the one who asked her to train with him. 
after a long and sweaty training session, Toka is taking a bath, and Saras is engaging in some degenerate activity with Toka's shirt, she realizes what she's doing is messed up, even if she does have feelings for Toka, and luckily it looks like no one was around to see her, except Toka who is standing behind her this entire time. He says he noticed that his clothes were missing, so he came to look for them and Sarah's apologizes, saying that she thought it would be a good idea to wash his clothes with hers. Later that night, Sarah's is asleep and Toka appraises her for how kind she is, she's diligently trying to become a sword that can protect him and she is suppressing all kinds of down bad emotions to fulfill her role to him, so he should be grateful to her. Sarah's wakes up and notices that Toka is still up, so he tells her he is just having a bit of trouble sleeping and Sarah's has a good remedy for that, so she gets out of bed and searches through her bag to retrieve some herbs. One of them helps with sleep, but the other has the opposite effect and leaves you excited and full of bedroom vigor. Of course, she doesn't intend to use it with Toka though since he's going to be taking herbs, Toka pulls out of the soup cube from his bag and uses it to make two cups of soup for himself and Sarah's. Toka asks Sarah's to have a taste before they add the herbs, and she's amazed by how good it tastes and how all that flavor was packed into a single tiny cube. Now that she has tried it, she's going to add the sleep herb too. However, she accidentally spilled a lot more in there than she intended to, the second one has a regular amount of sleep herb in it and Sarah's offers to drink the overdose cups since it was her mistake in the first place. As she and Toka drink it, they feel surprisingly refreshed, but they should be feeling sleepy, so Sarah's goes to check which bobble she used, and it turns out she mixed up the excitement herbs and the sleep herbs. She sincerely apologizes to Toka, but he says it's fine, he will just read his book to keep himself busy. Sarah's asked him if there are any special services she can offer him since she is sure he is stiff as a board right now, but while Toka is certainly feeling tempted, he asks her to just get some sleep. Sarah's is a surprised by how resistant Toka is to temptations, but it's not like he doesn't want to but his revenge takes priority over all else, so until he has made vicious pay, he won't be able to focus his attention on other things. In a way, it's like a curse that stops him from being happy until his goal has been achieved. However, once he is done with his revenge, he should be able to put his energy into other endeavors, so Sarah's gets behind him and swears that she will do everything within her power to help Toka get his revenge, and Toka is thankful for her help. The next day, they head over to the Bloodsport Coliseum and Sarah's returns to Toka after asking around about Eve, she's pretty famous around here and she was sold to the Coliseum as a slave, but from the very first day she got here, she was a hit with the fans and she hasn't lost a single match yet her three years of fighting. Tomorrow is apparently her final fight, meaning she's already earned enough money to buy her own freedom, so trying to negotiate with her using money won't be an option anymore. Additionally, Sarah's has learned that Eve already saved up enough money to buy her freedom two years ago, and she's now trying to buy the freedom of a small elf grow as well. There's also something Sarah's is worried about because all previous Coliseum champions have all died during their final match, so it looks like there's some foul play at hand, as there are rumors that the Duke is arranging to put fighters at a disadvantage during their final fights, but Toka smiles because this may be just what they need to get Eve to trust them. The story continues, we see Eve is the undefeated champion, and she's really popular, so there's no doubt that the Coliseum management team would try to kill Eva for the publicity it would create. Sarah's assumes Toka intends to stop this from happening at the main event tomorrow, but Toka doesn't see a reason to wait till tomorrow to save Eve, when he can just get it done today. Later that day, Toka corners Eve in dark alleyway and says he needs to talk with her, Eve tries to dismiss Toka and tells him she doesn't know where to find the Witch of Taboos, but Toka already knows that she's lying. He asks if Eve is trying to keep the witch's location hidden because she's indebted to the witch, but Eve denies it. However, Sarah's is there as well, and she immediately calls Eve out for lying again. Eve starting gets suspicious of Toka's intentions, so she's about to draw her sword, but Toka stops her by saying he just wants to help save Eve. She asks him what he intends to save her from, so Toka explains that the duke running the Coliseum is going to use all sorts of dirty tricks to make sure she goes down in tomorrow's match. Eve still doesn't understand why Toka would be trying to help her, but Toka just doesn't want to let his source of information on the witch die. It would be much easier to just take the girl she's trying to help and run away before the match tomorrow. Hearing this, Eve understands that Toka isn't threat to her, but while she appreciates his warning, she can't afford to run away from the match tomorrow. Taking the girl and running is an option, but where exactly would they run to? Unless she follows the rules and buys her and the girl's freedom, then the duke will send mercenaries to hunt her down or put bounty on her head. Maybe she'd handle life on the run if she were alone, but she has to think about the girl's safety. 
Toka says he knows of a place where they could escape to, and suggests that even the girl go into hiding at the place where the Witch of Taboos lives. He's sure no one would be able to find Eve there, but she says it would be impossible since no one can reach the heart of the Land of Monsters. Toka says they might be able to reach it if they work together, and he promises to help protect the girls to the fullest of his capabilities, but Eve doesn't think he has weight takes to follow through on that promise. She can tell that the girl with him has some amount of martial arts training, but Toka looks like a weakling to her. Toka admits that he doesn't have much skill when it comes to martial arts, but he is well versed in magic. He tells her that he can easily defeat the Skeleton King on his own, and while it's certainly an impressive feat, Eve isn't so convinced that Toka can handle the journey into the Land of Monsters. To prove that he is strong enough, Toka tells Eve that he's the one who killed the five Black Dragon Knights, but he thinks he is lying, so Toka gives her a demonstration of the power he used to kill Sivit and the others. He raises his hand and casts Paralyze on Eve, leaving her frozen in place. He warns her that she shouldn't try to move too much since it could cause damage to her body if she does, this is the power they use to defeat Sivit and just in case she still doesn't believe him. Ceres reveals her true identity, proving that the rumors of her death were false, and Toka truly saved her from Sivit. This should be enough to prove Toka's capabilities, so he releases Eve from the paralysis, and she's convinced that Toka wasn't lying to her earlier, but her decision hasn't changed at all. Toka sees that he's not going to be able to convince Eve, so he apologizes for disturbing her and says he hopes she finds a way to win her match tomorrow. However, if she happens to change her mind, he will be waiting at the bridge early in the morning ready to leave town. Toka then walks away with Sarah's, but as they are leaving, he comes across a group of Ashant followers of the Cursed God, and they are still riding the hype they got from stealing credit from Toka Achievement. Their fraudulent actions annoy Sarah's greatly, but Toka doesn't think there is a need to take action against them as long as they don't hurt anybody. However, as Toka and Sarah's continue walking, they spot some of the Cursed God cult members hurting someone. These guys are trying to kidnap this woman for unsavory reasons, so Sarah's is prepared to cut them down immediately. However, Toka stops her and says he will handle it himself, so he casts one of his new spells and makes the cult members go berserk and kill one another. While they are doing that, he continues walking home with Sarah's and by the next morning and Sarah's are all packed up and ready to go before the crack of dawn. It looks like Eve didn't show up after all, so Sarah's asks Toka if he thinks there's a chance Eve might actually be able to win her match and earn her freedom with the little girl. Unfortunately, Toka says there's no way that will ever happen, Duke Swan is well known for his shitty ways, so Eve trusting the word of a scumbag like him can only end in catastrophe for her. Meanwhile, Eve was having trouble sleeping because of the conversation she had with Toka last night, she still believes Duke Swan will honor their agreement, but she can't shake the feelings of doubt she has, so she decides to go to the Duke's office to confirm that he will really let her go after she wins her final match. As she approaches the Duke's office, she hears him as advisor talking about the final match tomorrow and how the spectators are going to miss Eve, but of course, he plans to have her die in that match because it would be good for publicity. Eve is shocked to hear that the Duke seriously planned to betray her, but the Duke goes on to say that he has always thought of Eve as nothing more than a wild beast that became profitable. Now that she's no longer going to be useful to him, he plans to have the next champion skin her alive and wear her belt around as a new gimmick. The advisor asks what the Duke is going to do about the Dark Elf Girl, Eve was working so hard to take care of, and he suggests that it might be a good idea to grant her freedom as a goodwill gesture since Eve kept fighting for an additional two years for the Dark Elf's sake. Duke Swan says he was actually thinking of taking the Dark Elf girl in, and his advisor surprised that the Duke is actually showing compassion for once, but the Duke didn't say no did he. He's only planning on taking her in because he has a young elf fetish, and once he's done with her, he will just sell the girl off to the nearest brothel. Eve now knows that Toka was right, and there really is no chance of being freed if she trusts the Duke, so she heads to the bridge to see if she can still take Toka up on his deal. She soon arrives at the bridge, hoping that Toka and Sarah's haven't left yet, and thankfully they were still there waiting for her. Toka asks if this means Eve wishes to accept his offer, and Eve confirms it as everything he said about the Duke betraying her was true. She still has some terms to discuss about their journey to the Land of Monsters, but she intends to tell Toka where the witch lives. In that case, Toka is satisfied and the only thing left to do is to get the elf girl. Meanwhile, the elf girl is being put to work in the tavern, but the cruel owner comes in to start yelling at her for being so slow and useless, the elf girl tries to ignore it and keep working. 
Unfortunately, the owner smacks the girl until she falls to the floor in tears. The only thing that still keeps her going at this point is the promise that Eve made to free her. The owner's is failure, so she sees nothing wrong with taking down all her pent-up frustration on the girl. She even starts screaming into the girl's ears just to torture. But a few moments later, Eve busts into the room and confronts the owner. Eve knew the elf crew was being abused here, but she had no idea that gotten this bad, so she's prepared to kill the owner for all the suffering she's put the elf girl through. But the owner begins begging for her life, and says it was Duke Swan that ordered her to treat Liz so harshly. Eve still can't stand the owner, but she decides not to kill her after all. Eve takes Liz's hand and tells her that the situation has changed, so they need to leave the city immediately. Liz says she's willing to go anywhere with Eve, so Eve turns to the owner and tells her that as long as she tells the Duke she doesn't know what happened to Liz, then she will be spared. The owner begins grumbling and swears that she will do everything Eve instructed her to do, and she starts apologizing to Liz, saying she regrets all the torment she caused Liz to go through, and she even starts crying on cue really sell the apology. Liz obviously doesn't believe her, but Liz isn't the type to go for revenge, so she just lets it go and turns to leave with Eve. But as they are leaving, someone who's totally fine with revenge walks in, so Toka tells Eve and Liz to go on ahead because he has some business to take care of. Once Toka confronts the owner, he tells her to drop the act because he knows what kind of person she is. The warning begins acting smug and says it will be over for Toka and the others as soon as she tells the Duke what they've done. Unfortunately, Toka doesn't really care, he just wants to make sure scum like her doesn't get to see another sunrise. After all the horrible things she has done to Liz, he casts paralysis and poison on her, but to avoid suspicion, he decides to make it look like a robbery and stabbed a woman to death. After he is done, Toka heads back outside and goes into the sewers to meet up with Eve and the others. Eve asks Toka what he did to the woman and he doesn't give a clear answer, but he says the woman won't be able to bother Liz ever again. As she said earlier, Eve will tell Toka where to find the Witch of Taboos, but before she does, she would like to know why he wants to meet the witch in the first place. Toka explains that he has a forbidden scroll written in ancient text, and he heard that the Witch of Taboos might be able to read it. Eve just wants to confirm that Toka doesn't intend to harm the witch in any way, so he assures her that he won't start anything as long as the witch doesn't attack him. Eve is glad to hear this and says there's something else she wants to discuss with him. She's in the smartest him and can't predict people's actions like Toka can, so she would like to square her loyalty to him as her masters. Toka is surprised by the sudden leap in trust where she still barely knows him, but Eve has realized that she can't solely base her trust on how long she's known someone. Besides, she knows for a fact that Toka is a good person because he could have used any number of violent tactics to force Eve to tell him where the witch lives, he even had the option of holding Liz hostage that he chose to save her instead. The group begins their journey, but before they can escape, the Duke has already sent out a search party to capture Eve and Liz. The Duke likely enlisted the help of the Ashant cult in the hunt, Toka has to come up with a strategy to beat them, so he tells Eve to take Liz and hide deep in the forest while he and Sarahs handle the ancient cult. The story continues, we see the cult enters the forest and spots some tracks, but the leader realizes that the tracks are too obvious, so it must be some kind of trap. He tells for the person behind this to show themselves, so Sarahs emerges from the forest with a mask on to confront them. The leader doesn't know who Sarah's is, but he's in a good mood today so he offers her a simple deal. As long as Sarah's hands over Eve and Liz he won't unleash the full power of the Ashen cult on her, and he claims that their power was able to take down the world's strongest human civet. In addition, he is even willing to allow Sarah's to join the ranks of the Ashen cults since he can tell that she is a skilled martial artist. Surprisingly, Sarah's agrees to his terms and says she will leave them to Eve and Liz, but the leader knows that no one ever switches sides that quickly, so Sarah's must be trying to lead them into a trap. The fact that she's trying to lead them into the forest means she must need them to be within a certain range for some sort of attack, so he tells his men to aim their bows at her and get ready to attack. She asked why they are using bows when they claim to have powerful curses, and since he intends to kill her anyway, the leader lets her in on a little secret. The Ashant cult was formed after the Assassin's Guild was exterminated by a summoned hero, and the cult just used his assassination techniques to eliminate targets, with a little bit of added poison of course. The poison is incredibly advanced and leaves no traces, so the cult is able to pass it off as it cursed to the unsuspecting masses. Furthermore, the fact that the cause of Sivit's death was unknown presented the perfect opportunity for the Ashen cult to gain popularity by stealing credit for the job, and the best part is that no one can ever prove that they weren't the ones who killed Sivit, so they'll never be caught. Sarah's asked why they're doing all this, 
so the leader tells her that they plan to use Duke Swan to carve out his central role for themselves in this nation, while also assassinating anyone who gets in their way, and speaking of people who are getting in their way, the leader asks where Sarah's allies are hiding, but she says she is the only one here to face them. The leader finds it hard to believe that she came out here intending to defeat them all by herself, but Sarah says she is confident in her ability and reveals her identity as the one who survived being hunted by Sivit. It makes a lot of sense to the leader why she would be confident in her abilities, but he still doesn't believe that Sarah could have defeated Sivit. He calls out one of his subordinates named Belgar and tells Sarah that this guy is the one who was meant to kill Eve in tomorrow's battle, and his younger brother Varagan is here as well so together these two are the strongest members of the Ashant group. Coincidentally, they also had a younger brother named Zarash, but he was killed while chasing after Sarah's, so the brothers have a personal grudge against her. Additionally, while she was distracted, the leader has already had some of the other members of the Ashant cult circle around the cut off her escape route. Now there's a chance that she will be able to escape, so the leader tells her to give up now and submit to him otherwise she will be killed by the poison. Sarah's does as she is told and kneels for the leader, but just when he thought he had won, Toka uses his special move to extend his range and paralyze all the members of the cult. He also already took care of all the cult members that were trying to flank them, so no one is coming to save the leader. Toka intentionally made their tracks obvious to make the leader suspicious of Sarah's, and once he felt like he had all the power he let his guard down, and that's when Toka struck. Everything went exactly as Toka planned, so Toka asked her to go back and inform Eve and Liz that the Ash End have been taken care of. Once Sarah's has gone, Toka spots the first group in the process of retreating, so he wants to take them out and ask Pigamaru to connect with him again. Unfortunately, after all the strain he's been under Pigamaru doesn't have the strength to transform anymore, since Pigamaru can help him, Eve offers to lend him her assistance in taking out the remaining bounty hunters. In the meantime, Sarah's takes Liz deeper into the forest to keep her safe until the hunters have been dealt with. Toka asked Eve if she can get an accurate estimation of the number of assailants they'll be facing, and once she's figured out their number and distance she and Toka wait for them to arrive. The bounty hunters soon spot Eve, and they intend to capture and drag her to the Duke's feet, but just before they can attack her, Toka paralyzes and poisons all the soldiers present, leaving them frozen in place. Just then, the Duke and his advisor show up on horses behind Eve and Toka, and the Duke believes he has Eve cornered, so he intends to personally kill her for having the gall to not want to die. On top of that, he will skin Eve alive and make a pair of underwear out of her hide just to be disrespectful. Toka is sick of hearing the Duke's rambling and attempts to use Paralyze to take him down, but he is shocked when he receives an error message that says he has exceeded the number of targets for Paralyzed, so he can't use that ability right now, and that means he's going to have to get creative, so he uses his darkness spell to blind the advisor, leaving him wide open for Eve to slash him in two. Toka continues doing the same thing with the rest of the soldiers, and Eve cuts them down accordingly, but a few of the soldiers are smart enough to realize they stand no chance, so they start running away. Toka tells Eve that she can't let any of them survive, so Eve grabs a spear and throws it to take out one of the fleeing soldiers. A couple of paralyzed slots have been freed up now that some soldiers have died, so Toka is almost ready to finish things off, but in the meantime Sarah's is here to keep him safe. The Duke is throwing a tantrum over the fact that his soldiers aren't capable of killing a single man and Eve thanks Toka, because she never could have gotten the opportunity to have her revenge without him. She runs out and quickly slaughters the rest of the Duke's soldiers, and now that the Duke has no men left, he yells that he will make Eve pay for this and turns to go home, but we all know Toko wasn't going to let him leave here alive. Eve approaches the Duke and honestly, if he had only intended to betray her then she might have forgiven him, but for going after Liz, Eve has no mercy to give and slashes his head off. Now that everything is over, Toka asks Sarah's to take Liz and get ready to leave soon, but he has one more thing he needs to take care of. He walks over to one of the dead bodies and uses his freeze ability, and when used on a quirk it creates a layer of ice that can be shattered and completely disintegrate the body. This way Toka can eliminate all traces of the Ash Ant from the world, and no one will ever know what happened here. A while later, the news of the Ash Ant cult's disappearance reaches the king, and he is in a state of panic because he had intended to use the Ash Ant as pawns to accomplish his goals, but now that they are gone, how is he going to explain this to the goddess? He can afford to find out what Vicious will do to him once she finds out, so he orders his men to locate the Ash Ant cult as soon as possible. Back with Toka group, Liz and Eve have both gone to sleep already, so Sarah's offers to keep watch while Toka gets some sleep as well. 
Toka says he doesn't feel like sleeping anytime soon, so Sarah's offers to let him rest on her lap until he feels like sleeping, and he appreciates the offer, but Sarah's was pretty tired, so if anything he would like to offer his lap her to sleep in. Sarah's didn't think twice about taking him up on his offer, so she lays down on his lap, only to realize that Toka might have been joking when he made the offer. It gets a little awkward after that, but since it can't possibly get any more awkward, Toka asks if he can touch Sarah's elf ears, Sarah's is caught off guard, but she allows it, so Toka gets to feel her ears. After that's done, the two of them decide to stay up and Sarah's asks Toka if he has any special feelings towards Eve or Liz, because he's far more gentle with them than he would be with any other people. Toka explains that it's for the same reason that he likes Sarah's so much, they remind him of people whom he wants to protect. Eve reminding him of his uncle and Liz is the same way Toka used to be when he was younger, they were both abused by the people in charge of them and the only difference is that Liz is still kind enough to forgive those who hurt her. While Toka has no problem killing anyone and threatens him, and he doesn't intend to change the way he does things. He tells Sarah's that she's free to leave him if she ever gets tired of the life of vengeance he led, but Sarah's doesn't intend to leave him for any reason. Toka is happy to hear that she will support him, so he tells her that he will fulfill any one request of hers to the best of his ability, so when she has decided what she wants, she can ask him if for now he tells her she should get some sleep. Meanwhile, over on Alien, Ayaka is receiving some swordsmanship training down in the prison, and her instructor praises her because she's been proving a lot since they started training together, but she reminds Ayaka that she can't tell anyone about their training sessions because Vicious is so petty that she would probably forbid Nyantan from training Ayaka any longer. Ayaka asked Nyantan and why she agreed to help her train when she doesn't get anything in return, so Nyantan explains that she took a liking to Ayaka because she looks a lot like Nyantan's sister. And before she leaves she reminds Ayaka that this world is incredibly ruthless so she can't show any weakness if she wants to survive. The next morning, Toka group is preparing to set out on their journey to the land of monsters and Toka has brought a new dress for Liz to wear and she absolutely loves it. Before they leave, Sarah suggests that should come up with a name for their groups since they might need to identify themselves once they get to the land of monsters, she already has a name in mind and suggests that they could call themselves the Lord of Flies War Band, and everyone seems to like the name, Toka agrees to go with that. After a lot of off-screen traveling, the group eventually arrives in the land of monsters and Toka notices a giant dead tree in the distance, so Sarah explains that the tree is called the Corrupted Tree, although it used to be a sacred tree. Eve asks Toka to pour some magic into her hand so he does, and Eve is able to pull up a magic map which was passed down to her people, it will allow them to locate the witch so they begin the long trek to the witch's home. By nightfall, they set up camp and Toka stares off into the distance while thinking about his motivations, he may be a fool to be so sad on vengeance but he still feels nothing but burning hatred towards Vicious and the others who abandon him and he will annihilate any monsters he comes across to gain XP and become strong enough to get his revenge. The next morning at Alien, Vicious congratulates the heroes on leveling up but they still lack techniques, so she's gone through the effort of gathering several famous figures to act as their instructors. Vicious tells them that the Demon Empire is definitely making a huge move soon, so she wants the heroes to participate in the battle against them, and to make sure they're ready by then, she plans to send the heroes to the land of the Golden Eye monsters to train. The story continues, we see Toka group makes their way through the land of the Golden Eye monsters, Liz offers to carry the majority of the luggage because she wants to help everyone out. The others tell her she doesn't need to carry it all by herself, but since she seems really determined to help, they respect her wishes and let her carry the bags. They continue through the forest and they suddenly sense something coming, so Toka and the others stop and take their battle stances. A monster soon appears before them and Toka thinks it looks pretty similar to one of the lizard monsters he had to face back in the ruins of Disposal, with the only difference being that it has a seaweed head. Regardless of its nature, their plan attack remains the same so Eve engages with the monster in order to keep it distracted, and once Toka is able to get within range he uses Paralyze and Poison to take it out. Eve asks if Toka achieved what he wanted, and Toka says he is satisfied because he needed to make sure his Paralyze and Poison abilities still work on the monsters here. After facing one of the monsters here personally, Toka can say with certainty that these monsters are inferior to the ones he had to face in the Ruins of Disposal, and if this is the worst this place has to offer then getting to the witch isn't going to be a problem. Toka begins dissecting the monster, which seems a bit odd so Sarah's asked him what he's doing, and he explains that he has seen this monster in the Forbidden before and parts of it, and apparently be used to make a Forbidden item. 
The item is something like a voice modulator and Toka thinks it could come in handy so he wants to make one. He sees that Ceres seems interested in the information from his forbidden book, so he tells her she can keep it for the meantime if she wants because he trusts her with it. Once Toka is done collecting his materials the group keeps moving until they come across a large body of water. Eve and Toka are the first to cross and Liz wants to go next so Ceres warns her to be careful not to slip on the stones. Eve thinks it would be better to just carry Liz across since she's still just a child, but Toka thinks it's better to let Liz do things on her own from time to time. Liz agrees because it's not like she's going to fall over. However, a moment later, she indeed falls over and nearly ends up in the water, but Toka sends Pikimaru to save her before that happens. Even though she ended up failing, Toka believes that what's important is that Liz has the confidence to try things by herself. Once Liz finally makes it over to the other side she notices that Toka and Eve are talking about something that she thinks they might be making fun of her for almost falling into the river. Eve doesn't want Liz to feel self-conscious, so she makes up a lie and says they were actually talking about the kind of kids Toka and Sarah's are going to have. As she says this, Sarah's overhears her and loses focus, causing her to fall into the river. Once they finally get her out of the river, Sarah's apologizes for letting herself get distracted like that and she doesn't want to delay the group, so she tells Toka they don't need to wait for her clothes to dry out. Toka agrees to keep moving, but he wants to give Sarah's his coat, so she doesn't end up catching a cold and Sarah's grateful for his offer. The group then continues making their way through the forest, but before long, Toka and Eve send something up ahead, so they tell Liz to get behind them as they prepare for battle. Eve tells Toka that she recognizes these monsters and she knows for a fact that she can't beat them so she asks Toka what they should do. Toka tells her that she should sit this one out and let him handle it on his own, so if he hides behind a tree and waits for the monsters to enter his effective range. As the monsters come into view, Toka can understand why Eve would stand no chance at defeating these things, because almost no one could beat them in a regular fight. However, Toka doesn't intend to have a normal fight, so as soon as the monster's close enough he paralyzes them and then uses Berserk to make them bleed all over the place until they die. Once the monsters die, Toka notices that he leveled up again, but that's not important to him right now because he wants to start harvesting materials from the Nazorts. Eve looks at Toka and discusses and asks if he intends to eat that thing. Aceras interjects and explains that Toka doesn't intend to eat the monster, he's just collecting the materials because it's an ingredient in a forbidden item which will make Pigamaru stronger. Although, Pigamaru is going to have to eat it, it's not going to be a fun time for him. Just then Toka and the others sense a monster nearby, but they can't pinpoint its location because no malice or hostility is being directed at them. After looking around for a bit, Pigamaru tells Toka that the monster is inside his backpack, so Toka opens it up and takes out the egg he has been carrying. It looks like it's about ready to hatch, and a few moments later it does exactly the giving rise to a horse monster of some sort, none of them have any idea what it is since they've never seen anything like it before. While petting the horse, Toka feels something odd on its back so he pulls back the horse's hair and finds a magical organ there. Sarah's explains that most monsters have an organ like this for absorbing magic, so Toka comes up with an idea. He begins pouring his mana into the horse and hopes that will grow bigger. As he pours around 1000 mana points and horse transforms into a magnificent black steed. This would be perfect for luggage hauling, but the horse says Toka should keep pouring magic into it, and Toka got nothing to lose, so he pours 10,000 mana points in, and this time the horse transforms into a buff minotaur. Toka is pleased with what he sees, so he decides to have the horse to win their group and as such they need to give it a name, he thinks about it for a second and comes up with the name Slay, and Slay seems to really like it, so that becomes his official name. Elsewhere in the forest, Ayaka's group is busy apologizing to her because they've been nothing but dead weight this entire time, and contrast on A.S. Asagi's group has been doing pretty well since all of the team members are pulling their weight and working well together. The same goes for Takuo's group, but he isn't really satisfied with the progress they've been making so far because the fighters that are in charge of them have been taking care of all the really dangerous monsters because they think the heroes aren't ready to handle it, and Takuto hates being underestimated. Later that night, the fighters take the heroes hunting again, but they come across an area with a group of Nazorts up ahead, and they don't think the heroes are ready to handle something like this, so they ask the heroes to stand back while they handle it themselves. Takuo doesn't like being told to wait, but as the monsters approach Nyan says she will handle one on the right while two other fighters can handle the one on the left. It begin their attack and the Nazorts get defeated very quickly, but there are a lot more where those came from, so the fighters might need to come up with a new strategy to defeat them all. 
However, Takuto has already had enough of being underestimated, so he walks up to the front lines and uses his Dragonic Burst attack to incinerate all the Nazorts in one go. He then announces that his ability is only at level 4 and he has the power to cause this much destruction, so no one has the right to underestimate him for he is the future ruler of this world. The other heroes are in awe of Takuto's power, so much so that they barely realize that Hijiri and Itsuki aren't here anymore. The two of them are elsewhere in the forest, and they came here to deal with some spies that have been following the group, but the second the spies were captured they off themselves, so they couldn't be interrogated. While all it is going on Toka and the others have settled into an old building so they can spend the night, they've been making a lot of progress thanks to sleep, so it looks like they will arrive at the witch's house much sooner than they had expected. Sarah's asked what Toka came out here to look at, so he explains that he saw some lights coming from the forest, so he thought some monsters might be fighting down there. Sarah's points out that the light is coming from the northeast and Toka realizes that's the direction of Alien, so whatever is going on down there must have something to do with the goddess. The next morning, Eve and Sarah's wake up to find that Toka isn't here anymore, Eve isn't particularly worried because she knows Toka isn't the type of person to abandon them in the middle of the land of monsters, Sarah's agrees with her so they head outside to go looking for Toka, and they don't have to look for long as Toka is sitting outside the building after having killed a massive monster. Once Toka notices them standing behind him, he greets the two and tells them that he had sensed monster nearby earlier, so he came out to take care of it, and now he's looking for the monster's body parts to see if there's anything useful in here. After Toka is done, the group continues their journey, but they eventually come across a vertical cliff, and they have no way of climbing it, so they are going to have to follow the road along the cliff instead. Sarah suggests that Toka should take a break, since he hasn't gotten any proper rest in a while, but Toka says they need to keep moving because the air is becoming humid, and he would like to get as far as possible before it starts raining. As they walk along the road they find it odd that they haven't come across any monsters for a while now, but they just assume it must be because they are getting close to the home of the Witch of Taboos. Toka notices that Liz looks a little upset, so if he asks her if she's scared of the land of monsters, Liz tells him that this place is definitely scary, but she hasn't felt much fear since they got here, and it's all because Sarah's has assured her that as long as Toka is alive he will never lose to any monsters here. Eventually they make it to an opening in the cliff, and once they pass through, they'll be really close to the witch's home. Before they head through, Eve once again wants to thank Toka for all the help he has given since there's no way they would have been able to make it this far without him. Toka tells her there's no need to be so thankful since he mainly helped her to benefit himself anyway. Eve says she will be happy with anything as long as she and Liz are able to little quiet life together, maybe they could even start a farm together once they settle into their new lives and Liz likes that idea, but a moment later, a mouth monster appears above Eve, and it's too close for Toka use paralyzing time so Eve turns around and slashes it down. The monster is definitely dead now, but Toka still has a bad feeling about it for some reason, his worries are confirmed when the monster lets out an ear-piercing screech and a flash of blinding light which acts as a signal and alerts all the monsters in the area of the group's location. So now every monster in the forest is heading straight from Toka group, their chances of survival aren't looking good against this many enemies. The story continues, we see Toka tells the others to start moving since they have some time before the monsters reach here, but he doesn't think they'll be able to escape in time, so she offers to stay behind and act as bait while the others run away. Liz tries to talk Eve out of it, but Eve says she needs to do this since it was her actions that caused this mess. She asked Liz to listen to Sarah's and Toka while she's gone, but Toka never agreed to this plan of hers. He says he will only let Eva act as bait, if she promises to come back alive and Eve promises, but she didn't say I'm God so Toka knows she doesn't intend to survive. He tells her that she doesn't need to feel responsible for this since the monster that sounded the alert was hidden with concealment magic, so it was impossible to detect ahead of time and it was the right call to kill it when she did. Besides, if any blame is going to be dished out, he says it should be directed at him since he failed to cast sleep on the monster before it attacked. Any case, Eve is an indispensable asset to the team, since she's the only one who has a map to the witch's location and negotiations will go a lot smoother if she is there with him when he meets the witch. Toka then pulls out the voice projection stone he made earlier and sticks it in his helmet, before telling the others that he's the only one who stands a chance of surviving against that horde, as long as he has the help of Pigamaru and Slay. He's the only one here who can deal guaranteed fatal damage to the monsters anyway, so he tells Eve that she doesn't have to worry herself over it, Liz thanks Toka, but he tells her that it's too early to be thanking him since he can't guarantee that he will make it back alive either, although he's going to try his best. 
Sarah's kneels to wish Toka a good luck and he entrusts her with taking care of Eve and Liz if he ends up dying to the horde out there. Meanwhile, all the heroes are being evacuated because they are not prepared to handle a catastrophe of this scale. Ayaka tries to gather up all her team members so they don't get caught in a stampede, but they all get scared and start running off in random directions. Meanwhile, Oyamata and Takuto are trying to fight a bunch of the monsters, but they soon realize that the monsters are going after something else, and the fact that he is being ignored by the monsters pisses him off immensely. One of the girls running for her life when she accidentally trips over a rock and is about to be caught by the Hanzi monster before she could be harmed Kabato steps in to defend her. The girl thinks Kabato and runs away, leaving Kabato to fight the monster alone. Kabato steals her resolve and reminds herself that she needs to stay strong so none of her classmates end up dying, but then she remembers that she stood by and did nothing as Toka disposed of so she has no right to be acting all high and mighty. At the same time, Toka is just about ready to put his plan into motion, he ordered Sarah's and the others to go hide themselves in a nearby cave so they don't get caught up in the chaos, and that means there's no reason for him to hold back. Toka proceeds to pour his magic into Slay's stone and a bolt of red lightning can be seen all the way across the forest. Now that Slay is transformed, Toka takes out his helmet and activates the voice projection stone before asking Pigamaru to do the honors of starting the battle. Right on cue, Pigamari yells into the helmet and his voice is amplified hundreds of times over, leading all the monsters directly to Toka's location. Toka is glad the monsters fell for the bait so he puts on his helmet and prepares himself for a high speed chase. On Toka's signal, Slay begins running and Toka still isn't certain that he will be able to make it out of this alive, but he has a lot to protect right now, so he can't afford to let his worries show. Back at the hero's camp, Ayaka meets back up with Yasu's group, but she is horrified to find out that two of his group members have died, she doesn't understand how this could have happened since Yasu should have been strong enough to keep them safe, but Yasu just didn't care about them at all and ran to save himself. Ayaka is upset and asks why Yasu chose not to do anything to help them even though he's A-class, but again, Yasu just didn't give a shit about them and the fact that Ayaka is giving him a lecture on morals is really pissing him off right now. He knows she's not trying to be condescending, but the way she always talks makes her sound like she's acting all high and mighty. Ayaka doesn't understand what he's talking about since all she was saying was that the strong should protect the weak, but that's exactly what Yasu is talking about. The law of this world is strength and Yasu survived because he is strong, but the other two that died weren't even good people in the first place, so why would he care about them? Those two were among the first mock Toka as he was banished to his doom for being weak, so they can't complain now that the thing happened to them, not to mention the fact that they relentlessly bullied him back on earth. Takuto comes back over to the group just so he can insult Yasu and call him a nobody, it's clear from Yasu's reaction that he's still having a hard time coming to adjusting to the situation, so even if he may have some decent power right now, it won't be long before reality sets in and he is forced to bow down to Takuto's superiority. Yasu's enraged and activates his ability before telling Takuto that he shouldn't get the wrong idea and think he's superior just because he is S-class, because Yasu already figured out that your class is the only thing that determines your strength. For example, Ayaka may be S-rank, but she hasn't developed a unique ability yet, and on the other hand someone like Asagi, who is B-ranked has surpassed Oyamata even though he is A-rank so Yasu believes that sooner or later he will become more powerful than Takuto and make him regret his words. Oyamata is about to attack Yasu out of anger, but Takuto stops him since he sees no point in starting a fight amongst themselves right now, and Yasu is actually right about rank not necessarily mean strength, and he calls out Ayaka for being the weakling of the S ranks, so he expects her to get her act together soon. In the meantime, he plans to do something to demonstrate his superiority, so no one will have the gall to oppose him again. At the same time, while Sarah's and the others are hiding in a cave, Eve says she wants to go out and look for Toka all of a sudden, Sarah's has asked her what she wants to do that so Eve explains that there are a lot of monsters out there, so even with his ability, it would be difficult for him to win against them all. On top of that, Toka isn't in good condition since from the moment they set foot in the land of monsters, Toka has gotten the lowest amount of sleep to make sure everyone else stayed well rested, his sacrifices would allow them to make it this far into the land of monsters, so she needs to do what she can to help him. She wasn't bluffing when she said she could outrun the monsters in this region earlier, she's well versed in traversing difficult terrain, especially since she has night vision so she won't be caught by the monsters easily. On top of that, if Toka and Slay happen to be injured, she's the only one who would be able to carry them to safety. 
Sarahs agrees with Eve's reasoning and apologized for questioning her, but since Toka put her in charge, she had to make sure Eve wasn't taking unnecessary risks, she says she will allow Eve to go after Toka, but only on the condition that she makes it back alive. Meanwhile, Toka is trying to come up with a strategy to take down all the monsters, and while his ability won't be able to affect all of them at once, it will still get some of them, so he starts by casting Berserk on the monster making them fight one another. It seems to have been effective, but only for a little while as the monsters soon resume their chase, Toka then tries using Paralyze to slow them down, that doesn't buy him much time either, his situation isn't looking too good right now, as the rain is causing low visibility. On top of that, his MP is being burnt through really quickly because of his combination with Pigamaru, so if he wants to keep going, his only option would be to level up so he can restore his mana, and as long as he kills some of the high level monsters, it should be possible but a plan like that is too risky for him to rely on. If he's not within a certain range with target when it dies Toko won't get any experience, so the only way for him to guarantee that he levels up is to circle back and attack directly, he asked Pigamaru and Slay if they're alright with his plan, and they seem to be fine with it, so Toka turns around and charges straight into the horde of monsters. He's running low on MP so he begins spamming darkness and paralyzed to stop the monsters in their tracks, and with all of them immobilized he tracks down the monster with the highest level and casts berserk on them so it suffers paralysis damage. Just as Toka was about to run out of mana, the monster finally dies and he levels up so his mana supply is replenished, he now has a guaranteed method of replenishing his mana, so he can keep fighting almost indefinitely. He then proceeds to cast Paralyze and Berserk on all the monsters in the vicinity and starts running away again, but as he does, he notices two more high level monsters chasing him, so if he wants to take them out then he is going to have to get behind them somehow. He uses Pigamara cast sleep on the monsters, and by the time they get back up and try to start chasing again, Toka has snuck up from behind and takes them out. With those two dead, he once again levels up so he gets back on Slay's back and rides off to stay ahead of the horde. But unexpectedly, the second horde of monsters appears in front of him, so even though he tries defeating them ahead of time, Toka ends up getting knocked off Slay's back and is forced to continuously spam every effect in his arsenal, so he doesn't get overrun by the monster. Meanwhile, Kabato is busy having a panic attack in the forest over the fact that she is just as bad as everyone else, she wanted to try and be kind to others, but when Toka was thrown to the side all she could do was stand by and watch it happen. Just then, Kabato looks up and notices Eve standing nearby and from her perspective, the giant tiger she's never met before is staring her down, so she's really scared. Eve is surprised to find a human out in these forests because no normal people ever come here, so she approaches Kabato to get a better look, and that's when she notices that Kabato reminds her a lot of Liz. She doesn't intend to harm her, but that's not what it looks like to Itsuki, so she rushes in and nearly slashes Eve with her lightning sword. Eve is able to react in time, but she gets frozen and placed by Itsuki's lightning attack. Itsuki doesn't really care about Kabato, but her sister doesn't want to let Kabato die yet, so it's her job to rescue her right now, and she's going to have to kill Eve because she is a threat. The story continues, we see Eve's throat was paralyzed by the shock, so she can't talk right now, but she still has the strength to move although she is much slower than she was before. Itsuki is amazed that Eve was capable of withstanding her lightning, but as the fight goes on, Itsuki's movements become sharper so Eve eventually gets overwhelmed and is about to have her throat pierced. However, the last second Itsuki's sister arrives and tells her to stop, Itsuki is glad that Hijiri is here, but she wants to know why Hijiri told her to stop just before she took out this monster. Hijiri explains that Eve isn't a monster, although it would be easy for them to mistake her for one, she has learned of the beast people in this world so she knows that they possess intelligence equal to that of a human and as such, negotiations may still be on the table. Itsuki doesn't think Eve is willing to negotiate since hasn't spoken a word this entire time, but Hijiri reminds her that her ability prevents people from talking, so Eve physically can't speak. At this point that Itsuki realizes she may have messed up a little, so she sincerely apologizes to Eve for attacking her out of nowhere. While she's apologizing Eve feels relieved since these people seem pretty reasonable, so she won't have to fight. Hijiri asked Eve if she is willing to let this go without holding a grudge against them and Eve is fine with it, but before they go their separate ways, Hijiri formally introduces herself as one of the humans from another world, she already knows about Eve's history as a blood sport warrior since she has heard the rumors. But for Eve to be all the way out here, she assumes Eve must be searching for someone. 
Eve confirms it, saying she's searching for her master, and Hijiri finds this interesting because Eve implies that her master is still alive after facing the monster stampede, so she's even more intrigued by the person Eve calls her master. Meanwhile, Toka is continuing to hold off the monsters, but as he attempts to cast Paralyze once more, Pigamara runs out of juice, so he uses sleep and poison to take down the last monster. He still has a lot of mana in his reserves, but Pigamaru is completely exhausted from all the work he's been doing, so Toka endues their links so he can let Pigamaru rest. He also tells Slay that he doesn't need to work himself past the point of exhaustion, so if he needs to take a break, Toka can handle himself alone. Toka is a little wounded, but overall he's doing alright, and according to his status is even reached level 2000. However, while that may be nice, his wounds don't heal when he levels up so he's going to reach his limit as well soon. There's one more monster he has to defeat, and it is most likely a human-faced beast. Toka can't do anything to it while it's out of sight, and the monster knows this. It should why, when it charges at Toka, keeps its face hidden and begins firing several laser beams to keep him from focusing. One of those beams manages to hit Toka and Slay so they both collapse to the ground, Slay isn't going to be running anymore so Toka calls on Pigamaru to help him with one more thing. The monster fires another barrage of lasers kicking up a huge dust cloud so Toka can't use Paralyzed, but while it's busy looking for Toka on the ground, it gets distracted by Toka's helmet, so it thinks Toka is going to attack from behind instead and turns around to catch him. However, the person behind him turns out to be Pigamaru, and Toka is actually above, but by the time the monster realizes it, it had already been paralyzed. Toka admits that the monster's smart, but in its attempt to avoid giving Toka a clear line of sight, it also failed to keep an eye on Toka's position and that's why Toka was able to get the drop on it. Toka may have won, but he's in really bad shape from all the damage he took, so if he really hopes he doesn't have to fight anymore. Just then the monster dies, so Toka levels up again and this time is paralyzed skill levels up as well as unlocking an advanced skill. Toka is excited to hear that he got an advanced skill, but he will have to check it out once he gets back because he doesn't want to remain out in the open any longer. Just then Toka notices some rustling in the bushes, and it may not be a powerful monster, but in Toka's current state he can't fight back, so things aren't looking good for him. Luckily, Eve arrives just in time to save him, so she cuts the wolf in half and tells Toka that she has come to get him. Since he can barely walk, Eve carries him on her back as they head back to the cave and along the way she informs Toka, her encounter with Itsuki, Hijiri and Kabato but she assures him that she didn't give out any information that they could identify him by. Toka tells her she made the right call since even if those three aren't bad people, as long as they are connected to the goddess, they could hinder his plan for revenge, so it's best if everyone keeps thinking that he's dead. A few minutes later, Eve and Toka finally return to the cave and both Liz and Sarah's are really happy to see that Toka survived. Once they settle back into the cave, Eve heads out to keep watch for the night and Toka apologized for making her do this since she's probably tired as well. Eve doesn't mind since Toka is in much worse shape than she is, and shortly after she leaves Sarah's finishes bandaging Toka's injury. Toka thanked her for her help, but Sarah still wants to help him more, so she offers to repair his jacket since it got ripped during battle. Toka lets her do it and lays down, but even have all his exhaustion he still can't manage to get any sleep. Sarah sees this as a good opportunity, so she offers to let Toka use her lap as a pillow, and Toka initially doesn't take her seriously and says she should get some sleep, but Sarah's is insistent so Toka eventually agrees to rest his head on her thighs. Doing this brings back memories from Toka because he has never slept in someone's lap aside from his aunt and that was years ago. As he closes his eyes, Ceres holds his head and tells him he doesn't mean to carry all the burdens alone, every monster in the land of monsters attacked at once and Toka acted like he had full confidence in his chances of surviving, and certainly put Eve and Liz at ease. But Ceres could tell that he was lying the entire time so she was really worried, if he continues to push himself too hard, then he will inevitably succumb to the pressure, so Ceres intends to support him to the best of her ability, so that doesn't happen. All she asked is that Toka come to her whenever he feels overwhelmed or troubled, Toka appreciates this sentiment, although he feels like Sarah's being a bit overprotective. He jokes that she's like the older sister he never had and Sarah's finds it funny, but speaking of which, she's been mean to ask Toka how old he is. Toka answers that he's 17 and Sarah's a surprise because that means Toka is younger than her. Toka expected to be the younger one since Sarah's is an elf and he assumes he was at least 100 years old, but to his surprise, Sarah's tells him that she's actually only 19. 
She thought Toka was in his early 20s, but even though she now knows Toka is younger than her she doesn't intend to treat him any differently because he is still her lord no matter what. Eventually, Toka dozed off to sleep and Sarah's is glad he's finally getting some rest, but the moment he's out, she starts some down bad activity. She puts him down to sleep, but then she accidentally slips on the sheet and ends up in this position, she's getting pretty close to intentionally kissing Toka. However, at the last second she realizes this is messed, so she stops herself. A little while later, Toka wakes up and notices that Sarah is still awake so he asks her if she's having trouble falling asleep and she says yes, so he help her using his sleep skill. Toka chose not to bring it up, but he's totally aware of what she did and he didn't realize Sarah's has felt so strongly about him. At the same time, Kabato is returning with Itsuki and Hijiri, and Itsuki has a question asked since it makes no sense to her why Kabato is part of the Asagi's group. No matter how you look at it, Kabato's personality is much closer Ayaka than Asagi, so she wonders why Kabato chooses to stay with Asagi instead. Kabato explains that back when they were getting through their trials, Kabato couldn't bring herself to kill the monster that Asagi captured for her, so Asagi did it for her instead and said Kabato was now part of the family with some mild molestation involved. Kabato knows Asagi is dangerous, but she has a feeling that Asagi's behavior is exactly what Ayaka means as a wake-up call. Back with Toka's group, they are approaching the witch's territory and Sarah's looks like she's got something on her mind so Toka asked about it, and she tells him that she has something she wants to confess to him, but she doesn't have the courage to do it yet, so she'll tell him some other day. She doesn't realize that Toka already knows about her feelings and Toka intends to keep it that way as long as things can remain as they are until this mission is complete. The group eventually arrives and the witch's territory, and they come across an old magic seal on a tree. Toka is worried it might be one that activates a trap, but Sarah tells him that there's no need to worry since the magic seal looks like it hasn't been maintained in a long time. However, as they go further into the witch's territory, they find another magic seal, and this one still works so Gollum ends up being created, it was probably put here to stop intruders, so Toka paralyzes it. However, he chooses to leave it in one piece since he doesn't want to smash the witch's property and then head deeper and until they reach a place where there are no monsters at all and this must be where the witch is living, so they head into the cabin and find a hidden passage under the carpet. They head down into the basement and find tons of small golems there, but they all seem to be minding their own business so Toka doesn't bother paralyzing them. The final obstacle to pass is a door with a magic lock, and the only security system on it is that the lock requires an extraordinary amount of magic to open. It would be enough to keep most normal people out, but Toka's magic is more than enough to compensate so he's able to unlock it. Meanwhile, as Kabato and the sisters return to the camp, Ayaka is greatly relieved to see that Kabato is alright, but before she can get to Kabato, Asagi cuts in front of her and starts talking about how worried she was for Kabato's safety, even though she chose not to go help her. Kabato knows Asagi is being manipulative, but she just needs to put up with it for a little while longer until she gets strong enough. That aside, Hijiri is glad that they managed to find Kabato before she got hurt, because the assassins that were sent were most likely here to assassinate a bunch of the weaker people in class under vicious orders, and it was all done in an attempt to make Ayaka lose hope in her ability to protect others, so the nice class dynamic would collapse. Back to Toka's group, before they open led them to a room where they can see the sky even though they are underground. How that works is a total mystery, but for now they focus their attention on the woman who emerges from the house. The woman introduces herself as Erika Anarovial and she confirms that she is indeed the Witch of Taboos, so Toka is finally one step closer to his ultimate goal of getting revenge on Vicious. This is the last episode of Season 1, subscribe for more anime recaps. Thanks for watching.